Welcome to the Northern Myths Podcast, where we take a look at the myths and legends of Northern Europe from an archetypal perspective. I'm Dan Larrabee. And I'm Luke DeWolf. In episode six, which we're doing today, we'll be taking another look at the Havamal, continuing our series. The Havamal, of course, is the sayings of the High One, sort of a, a book of advice uh, that is purportedly to be written by Odin, and it's about how you live your life and exist socially in the world. Do you have anything to add today, Luke? No, it was uh, that covers it pretty well. Sounds today's good. today's themes are uh, a lot of them are kind of on the same track about how we deal with each other in society and build friendships. So should For be sure. a good one. Sounds good. And how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Excellent. I'm pretty good. So shall we uh, dive right in? Well, I think uh, we wanted to first of all, as usual, cover. Absolutely. The copy of the Poetic Edda that we're reading, which is the Poetic Edda by Jackson Crawford. So it's a highly accessible translation. And for the Havamal in particular, I think it's it's been one of the easiest to read and understand. Definitely. And so I uh, highly encourage you to, to pick that version up. If you'd like to follow along with us, it's available uh, on Amazon. And we'll have a link below, both in paperback and in Kindle edition, if that's uh, something that you prefer. I find that really handy myself, actually. For sure. Uh, as well, we'll have a link to uh, Jackson Crawford's uh, YouTube page. Uh, he's got a great channel uh, where he goes over uh, how to speak like Old Norse and the meanings and how that relates to how we understand the story today. It's a great page. Great page and some some good videos on intro to Norse mythology as well. So, I mean, definitely a really good uh, resource to check out. So thanks to Jackson Crawford for letting us, uh, and Hackett Publishing for letting us uh, read his, uh, his translation. Absolutely. And uh, we did want to remind everyone that we are on social media now, finally. We are uh, on Facebook and Twitter at Northern Myths or slash Northern Myths, however you want to look at that. But we're, we're on both uh, both platforms, Instagram as well. Yes, uh, Northern Myths Podcast. You can find us there on Instagram. Definitely. And uh, we're both personally on Twitter as well. I'm at North Myths Luke. Dan is at North Myths Dan. Northern right. Myths Luke, Northern Myths Dan is apparently too long for a, a Twitter handle, unfortunately. But uh, I think you can figure out who we are anyway. So we'd uh, love to get in touch with all of our listeners and uh, and interact and uh, yeah please uh, please check us out on all of those platforms if you like we we finally made the leap yes and speaking of interacting with uh, you know you people out there um, we actually have some uh, earlier this week we put out uh, one of the verses that we'll be covering and uh, it's kind of a tricky verse so we wanted to get uh, your opinion on it and so we've. Uh, We've got someone who uh, graciously wrote in, you know, to help us out about what the meaning of it could be. So we'll uh, we'll definitely cover that when we get to that verse. Exactly. And uh, we, we plan to do this in the future. There's never going to be, uh, I, I am sure, there's never going to be uh, an episode where we are 100% sure of everything that we're going to talk about. And uh, yeah, a few days before we record, we'll definitely be putting out uh, some kind of uh, either verse or series of verses or a concept or something like that, that uh, we'd like uh, everyone's input on and uh, highly encourage you to check us out on our Facebook page or our Twitter Twitter and uh, help us out with that. So for sure, we'll definitely give credit where credit's due. And, uh, you know, if you uh, have the best comment, the uh, or the one that we uh, we like the best, we'll, we'll definitely mention your naming and, and give credit. So yeah. sounds good. So please, you know, give us all the feedback you can. Absolutely. I'm good to go if you are. Let's do it. So last time we stopped off at, I think it was verse 27, which was uh, appropriately enough uh, know when to keep your mouth shut when you're talking too much. And, uh, yeah, so we <laughs> good place to end the episode yes. there. <laughs> so, uh, we'll start right up again with, uh, verse 28. You will seem wise if you know the answer and know how to explain it. People are not able to keep a secret of what they hear about other people. Luke, what does that mean? So I like this stanza. I like a lot of, uh, I'll, I'll say that a lot, but I, I like this one. It's uh, it's interesting. I think it goes into the concept of you learn more if you are able to teach someone or able to explain some something to, to someone, you know, what you're learning. I know I find it's really helpful if I've just learned some kind of a concept, whether 
it's at work or, or just in one of my hobbies or something like that. Uh, if I learn something new, if I'm able to explain it back to the teacher or to someone else who is also learning, I know that it reinforces those things in my mind and I, and I definitely, uh, uh, feel better about my, my knowledge, my ability to, uh, to use what I've, I've just learned. So that was the, the biggest theme that I got there for the first half of the verse. And then in the second half here, I think it's saying something like, you know, people are not able to to keep a secret, right? I think that that kind of points to that your reputation will spread positive or negative, no matter, no matter what. And if you, uh, if you are, you know, saying, trying to look smart or appear smart and trying to explain things to people, but you're actually getting it wrong, that's going to spread like wildfire. But if you're, if you're getting it right and you are teaching something valuable, that also is going to spread. So a two-sided uh, stanza, and we will get a lot of those, but uh, I think those were the the main themes that he was tr- trying to get at there. So, Yeah, that, that's interesting. I actually went in a slightly different direction, but it'll sort of dovetail nicely into it. Um, so what I looked at, uh, and I've got written down here, is if you're going to say something important and with nuance, um, be precise with your speech. And... And I sort of, I, I took the second half to mean, so if you're going to say something and usually if you have a, an opinion on something that is complex, so any opinion you have, there are probably going to be people who disagree with you and disagree with you greatly. So they're, if you aren't speaking precisely, they're going to take one thing that you said, run away with it and then say, sort of, and you know, ruin your reputation, even though you've got this you know, well thought out opinion, they're going to tell, they might tell people that, uh, you know, you believe something when it's just, it's just not true. So just, just be precise with your speech. Um, and I, I think that it, I think that really feeds into like when you're learning something as well. And you're, if you're explaining it back to the teacher, be precise in what you're saying. So you can crystallize what you're, what you're learning. So it, it's just, it's funny because we got different things from it, but it really all is circling around the same idea of sort of precision in thought and speech. Definitely. Uh, no, I really like that. Is, isn't it some kind of political rule that, you know, if you're, if you're talking to someone giving an interview or whatnot, you, you don't say something sarcastically that you don't actually mean or something like for that, sure. because that's going to be the sound bite that they, that they play on all the news stations forever sort yeah, of thing. Definitely. And, uh, and in print as well, like sarcasm, that's why like on social media, sarcasm is hit or miss because if people don't know you and your sense of humor, you could say something that's clearly sarcastic to you and the people who know you, but if someone who doesn't know you is just going to read something, then you're, you're going to look like a terrible person, right? So Yeah, and, and it also speaks to the idea that people aren't going to take things in context if it, if it suits their agenda. Exactly. And, and I think here that that just nails down the importance of, of being precise, like you said, which is, you know, no matter what context you think people should be able to understand, you know, if you're being as precise as possible, it leaves little or less room for misunderstanding. I won't say none, because honestly, people are people and people are free to interpret things however they like. But if you are as precise as possible with your speech, you can uh, minimize any potential damage to your reputation or a reputation that gets built on something that isn't truly what you believe. Definitely. And I definitely, uh, it'd be a mistake not to mention that. Uh, This particular idea of being precise with your speech, I I didn't just dream it up one day. I totally heard it from uh, Dr. Peterson. But when I read this, I was like, yeah, which rule is that? I can't. I, can't, I don't remember the the order. Of I don't know, but <laughs> that's okay. Twelve rules for life. Jordan Peterson. Yeah, check it out. Check it out. It, it's actually a pretty good companion for the Havam all. Just if you're if you're interested, like it. There's a lot of crossover that you can find. We made a joke last time that you could completely make a drinking game out of times that we mention uh, Jordan Peterson or one of his twelve rules or something like that. But don't do it because last episode was all about uh, not over drinking. Sure, sobriety and. So don't do it. Don't do it. But you could. Because it comes up so much. And that's that's all I have for this verse. So if 
Yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay. The good one, though, start off with something nice and meaty, deep. So verse 29, back to the poem. You will hurt yourself with all your talking if you never close your mouth. A hasty tongue, unless it's disciplined, often earns its owner punishment. So I think this this actually continued part of the, the previous thread. It's, it's something to do with moderation of speech you know don't uh don't run your mouth even if you're knowledgeable and you know what you're talking about i mean i I think anyone can be dragged into a a long argument with with someone and get just dragged into the mud and you know slinging words at each other where the solution might just be to uh uh step back and and maybe uh get yourself out of that situation and not talk your way into, uh, you know, earning yourself some punishment, right? For so. sure. It, it reminds me, and it, I like that it's like an actual verse in the Havamal that one of those very, it's a very common experience where you're in the heat of the moment, you say something and you realize that one, you don't really mean it, especially, and it especially happens when you're arguing with like friends and loved ones where you say something and you're immediately as it comes out, you're just like, I I don't actually mean that. I was just, I'm just arguing. And, uh, and in those cases, the the punishment is usually just you feeling bad because you've just been a jerk to someone that you actually care about. So yeah, I like that. It's very practical advice. It's things that are happening in your day-to-day life. And, you know, the all father has deemed it worthy enough to put in his advice to how, you know, how to live your life. So Exactly. It's, it's, uh, it's definitely helpful for me to see these sorts of ideas in so many different places, right? I mean, the, the use of the word discipline here, I mean, that's obviously a, that's a conscious choice, first of all, of the people who originally wrote this, you know, we're, we're, we're going with the idea that it was Odin, but you know, also keeping it real though. Um, but uh, I, I think it's also a conscious choice of the translator. You, you know, we, we have to keep that in mind. And, and uh, I, I like that that is the word that Dr. Crawford chose in this particular case. Because there's, there's a lot of people talking about, you know, how if, if, you're, if you're disciplined, you can, you can avoid things going astray in your life and, uh, and things falling apart. You know, if, if you discipline yourself with your schedule, you know, you can actually find that you can do more in your day. Or if you discipline yourself in what you say, you know, you're not going to come out looking like an idiot. And punishment here, I mean, you mentioned, Dan, that it's, it's something like it could just be as innocuous as you feel bad because you hurt someone's feelings sure. or, or something like that, someone you care about. But it could be a lot worse. It could, oh, turn, into, uh, it could turn into something that uh, gets you in real serious trouble. And if you discipline yourself against that, that's going to be uh, – it's going to go better for you. And, and so it's, it's, it's nice to see here ideas that are talked about in all sorts of different places, you know, other other books of – wisdom we could say you know who emphasized discipline and it's also right here in the Havamal thousand years old book of wisdom from Odin so just reinforces that these are are good ideas I think definitely yeah if a lot of people are saying it sort of around the world without sort of that cross-contamination as it were it's probably good advice. <laughs> yeah, and, and and for those of you who don't necessarily know, uh, we're referencing specifically Jocko Willink, a uh, very good uh, podcaster and author who, uh, who uh, one of his, uh, his phrases is discipline equals freedom. And that's just something to look into and check out. Definitely. Yeah, the Jocko Willink podcast. It's fantastic. Speaking of, uh, unless... I'm good to go. Good to go, okay. Yep. Back to the poem. A man may seem wise if he pokes fun at another when the other man is away, but the man who talks behind another man's back is a fool, even if his listeners laugh. So honestly, this one seemed uh, relatively straightforward to me. Yes. Um, but um, you know, don't make, don't talk behind other people's people's back right like that's that's just something that you shouldn't do i mean uh, i i don't really read this as 
much deeper than that. Honestly, it's this is this is saying something very straightforward. If the the man who talks behind another man's back is a fool, even if his listeners laugh, and and I mean I think that says something about being straightforward with people, you, you know, talking to people about your differences and your disagreements, and not um, not necessarily uh, you, you know conniving or. But this is about honesty. I think is is really the the bottom line. It's it's sort of saying that you should you should be upfront with your opinions and your beliefs and not go behind other people's back. I, I don't have much more to it than that, to be honest. Yeah, definitely. And you, you never know if you're around people who are you know good friends with them. I've I've seen situations where people have uh, said things to me, not knowing that I was good friends with someone, and then you know just sort of marking that back in the back of my head being like, okay, so I know where you're coming from. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's just not a good idea. Like period. Doesn't give uh, your opponent for lack of a better term, uh, the ability to defend themselves. Right. Exactly. You know, I mean, that's a tenet of a uh, specifically American law, I think, but it's also something in, in other common laws that you you have your right, the right to face your accuser or something like that. Right. I don't know if that's got a direct parallel in Canadian or British law, but no, it, well, exactly. You know, there is a, in Canadian British law, there is sort of an idea that you, you get to know what you're being charged with and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, no, it's just, it's just not a very classy thing to do. Yeah. So I just realized I hit uh, verse 31 and skipped verse 30. So we're going to do a little uh, jump back. If you're gonna, I'm good at right. that. Yep. No one should ridicule anyone else, even if he owes him money. Many a man seems wise if he is never questioned, but he may prove otherwise. So to me, these two verses, I think, actually went pretty well together. The the one following and, and this one. But bottom line is it, it's something like, you know, don't make fun of people unnecessarily. There's there's time for for joking in the sense that builds camaraderie and whatnot. You know, groups of people who have to work together in difficult circumstances, for example, you, you know, joking together, making fun of one another in a, in a friendly way, in a way that sort of builds everyone up because everyone is equally able to take the same kind of beating. You know what I mean? For sure. That's, that's one thing, you know, between friends, it's, it's all good, but then there's actually, you know, making fun of someone for, first of all, things that could not be under, maybe are not under their direct control. First of all, you know, their, their physical abilities or. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's a good point. But then also there's things that, you know, maybe they're, they're not exactly, uh, perfect at things that, uh, you know, character flaws or ways that they're coming out, uh, in not exactly the best way. And it's things that they can control, but, you know, making fun of them for that instead of, uh, you know, maybe you, you, you help them out instead of making fun, which, which is, I think in this context, uh, implies something negative. Like you're, you're not trying to help them out through this. You're, you're, you're sort of trying to tear them down, right? You can come at that from the opposite perspective and try and build them up and, you know, let them know, Hey, maybe this is, maybe this is something that you could work on. But at the same time, I think this is something that could be at any time turned around back onto yourself, right? So this is, this is just an idea that if you if you ridicule someone for whatever reason, I don't think anyone is uh, going to be able to be without blame on you know wh whatever count. Nobody's perfect, right? And so, you know, if if you're the type of person, I think this is saying if you're the type of person that's going to make fun of of somebody else, you know, you uh, you can get that turned right back onto yourself. You know, maybe you're not just to tie it back in here directly, you know, many a man seems wise if he's never questioned, but he may prove otherwise, right? If that turns back onto you and you get questioned or, or ridiculed, made fun of whatever, you know, faults in yourself could come to light. So, I mean, at the very minimum, what you can do to, to avoid having that turn back on yourself, I think is not to do that to others in the first place. For sure. Uh, and just building on this, in this particular example where uh, you should, you know, someone owes you money, so they're already in your debt and beholden. So there's already, you already have a lot of power over them and, and you have the ability. And I think that's why they mentioned it here is that you, you're in a position where you could very much humiliate them and you shouldn't because 
it's an abuse of the the power that you have over over them. Uh, and it, there's an idea that you should always give someone um, space to save face. I didn't mean to make that rhyme, but it does. Um, and so, like, if you're in an argument with someone or someone owes you money, where they're the situation is clear that they, they owe you something. You don't want to back them into a corner with no way to leave uh, without being humiliated because then when people feel like that or animals, if you back them into a corner, if you back anyone into a corner or, or any animal into a corner, they're going to fight their way out and it'll get a lot uglier uh, if you don't, if, if they don't have a place to save face. So why, why would you back them into a corner so that like it's basically you're only backing them into a corner if you want to humiliate them or have a knockdown drag out fight. And in most cases you don't. So it's just not a good idea. And I think that that's what it's getting at as well. Just even if you have power over someone, it doesn't mean that you should abuse it, not, not exercise it uh, responsibly, but just again, don't be a jerk about it. Yeah, tying it back into a larger framework of themes here, it's pretty safe to say in a lot of cases that uh, many of these verses, the common thread turns into don't be a jerk. It's it's really, yeah. it's as simple as that. Not really, but it, it's it's a common theme throughout all of these these things. And, and, it, and it ties back into really just being a, a way of being, a way to, to carry yourself in the world, to live honorably and to to carry yourself with honor in in a way that's going to encourage other people to keep inviting you to play the game exactly so i think that's that's what this is kind of getting at and yeah just a in general a good good way to uh emphasize that uh you know maybe you should just take the high road i think is really for sure i think i think you're right all right moving on to verse 32 and we're going in the right order again Many men are kind, but can be driven to fight. There will always be conflict between men. When there's more than one, there's a fight. So this is a good one. A lot of layers to to this one. So, and and actually, I think it did. It touches on what you were just mentioning. Something about you know, you put somebody into a corner. You know, they're they're going to fight their way out, sort of thing. But this is even more general. You know, if there are two men they say in spe- in particular here there there will always be conflict and what i think that's actually getting at it's not necessarily just physical conflict it's it's the idea that men specifically are competing against one another for dominance this is a description of the male dominance hierarchy i think because it's it describes competitiveness and competence that that struggle to be better than the other people around you. And I mean, we can extend this out these days to the the women as well who are playing this sort of the same game, you know, the, the increase in women in the workforce who are, you know, working their way up the same dominance hierarchy as well. But, you know, the it, there are different dominance hierarchies traditionally, right? But no, no reason to, to be exclusionary. Uh, this verse it would have just been in a context where mostly they're talking about men doing the physical, uh, physical violence and the physical competition. And also, you know, they are still playing in that kind of traditional level of a dominance hierarchy there. But I, I think that's what this is, uh, this is really getting at. Definitely. I, I have a lot of, a lot of the uh, same points, sort of the idea that whenever you have more than one person, in this case, matter when you have the the possibility of conflict, because eventually they they're going to want the same thing, and it uh, it might be one of those zero sum games where if one person gets it, the other person's not going to get it. So there's always, and I do like that there will always be conflict between men. I think that's a, a recognition as well that you can't get rid of that. There's always going to be that competition and conflict between men. And even amongst friends, I mean, it doesn't become necessarily a violent conflict or even an ill-natured one, but there is sort of an idea that you want, you want to do your best and hopefully that'll bring the best out of your friend 
will then do their best and bring the best out of you. And it's, you can actually use this to better yourself and the people around you. It's not, it doesn't have to be one winner and one loser. It, you can actually uh, build with it. And I think that's the, uh, that's sort of the, the goal of it rather than beating the other person, especially your friends who are, are sort of around the same level of you in the dominance hierarchy. If you can lift everyone up through the dominance hierarchy, that helps everyone. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think here these days in society, it's considered a part of, and I hate using this term, toxic max masculinity to, you know, have this competition. And, 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 you know, the, the idea behind that is that there's, there's the threat of physical violence and maybe necessary, we are somewhat beyond that, but I, I don't necessarily think that's true. It's, it's all about building competence. It's all about, you, you know, I mean, in some cases there are always going to be people, not just men. They're, they're boys and girls under the age of two who are incredibly violent Right. And, and it's possible for them to grow out of it. And, and it is more boys than girls, but it's not only boys. That's no, for maybe, sure. maybe the point that I'm getting at. And they can be socialized out of it and then turn into good, normal people. But if they don't get socialized out of it by the age of four, they just turn into, you know, sociopaths, psychopaths, monsters, whatever you want to call it, just incredibly violent people. And that's essentially their nature. That's that's what you know, the studies that talk about this are really getting into is that, you know, this is just happening in kids that are under the age of, of two. And often there's no, there's no commonality in terms of their, their upbringing or their, uh, their household. You, you know, this can be in a, uh, I'm, I'm sure people know many cases where there are two siblings, right. And, and one just has a completely different personality than, than the other. And they were raised in the same, same exact setting, but you know, one is grows up to be, uh, you know, much, a much more of a, a, a person, successful person. And maybe the other is, you know, actually violent and goes to jail or something like that. And, you know, that just speaks to that. That's a part of, uh, a part of our own, um, genetic makeup. There's people in this pool that might necessarily go and become violent. I've gotten off track a little, bring it back in. So, the the whole concept of toxic masculinity to me i think is getting it is talking about the the actions of a few people right that turn into you know these violent criminal behaviors and things like that whereas for the most part for the vast majority of people i think it's really just a an aspect of of competence and you know we, it's a it's a completely different question whether there should be more access to to mental health and and you know boys should be able to to talk about their feelings a little bit more sure i don't see anything inherently wrong with that but to just say that competing with one another for dominance is inherently bad i think that is what's wrong here and just to tie it all back in together acknowledging that there's always going to be conflict i think is is pragmatic it's understanding the way that we actually are as opposed to you know some sort of um fantasy where you, you know if, if we just change society enough so that you know boys aren't competing with one another everything is just going to be okay and egalitarian and and, and everything I, we're not seeing evidence that that is something that actually works certainly there might be some areas of improvement in society but it's not to the point where it is certainly it's not to the point where, you know, you can just label any sort of competitiveness as to toxic masculinity and then just shut the conversation down. No, I, I totally agree. And I, I actually, I actually don't think you, you got off track with, uh, with your, um, observations about sort of that underlying violence that, that exists between men and it, and it, and it exists because of one, since we're using the word uh, competencies, men are generally more competent at using violence just purely beca because of size and the way the, the male body is formed. Like it's, it's just sort of a natural thing. And this particular idea of underlying violence in men is one that Western civilization has been dealing with for thousands of years and dealing with very seriously. So even... Uh, Socrates and Plato's Republic, that that dialogue is very much based on how do you take that, they call it thumos, so spiritedness in men, and how do you di direct it? Because if you extinguish it, then you've got, 
you've literally got a useless man. If you let it run rampant, then you have a tyrant. So what, what is the proper way to direct it so that it's a benefit to society at large, then the family, then men as individuals. And so we've, we've literally been talking about this for thousands of years. Some ideas have been better. Some ideas have been worse about how to deal with it, but it's, uh, it's truly an age old problem. What, what do you do with men? Because there are, there is a, the potential for, you know, quote unquote, t toxic masculinity, if it isn't directed properly. I remember in, uh, in a course in university or maybe it was a, a book I read in a course where talking about men and manliness per se. And it was, if men aren't running into the burning orphanage to save the children, they're setting the fire and you, you have, you have to choose and hopefully you're directing, um, directing young men into the running into the, the orphanage to save the children and not the, being the one who started the fire. So, yeah, that's why I think it's a, a complete travesty these days to, to essentially say that men need to just sit down and, and, uh, you, you know, we've, we've had our moment sort of thing. The, the result of, of putting men on the back burner and, and not, uh, growing them and, uh, not giving them, opportunities because i i mean there there is it is a zero sum game you know if you're going to give more opportunities to to people who you know some people say are historically disadvantaged you are taking it away from from people who are you know just working hard essentially and and going for something on on Not their sure. merit which which a lot of boys and men are just trying to do right so then it well i mean that's that's more of a complicated uh um, issue then maybe we want to get into here. But my point is really that, you know, if you tell men to just, you know, sit down and get rid of your to toxic masculinity, I, 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 why do I have trouble with that word? Maybe because in, in yeah. my head, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, it, it, just get rid of your toxic masculinity by, you know, sitting down and being quiet and, and letting the girls run things for a change, something like that. That's going to create a generation of extremely resentful young men who have no outlet for their frustrations, for their their drive, their need to compete and to grow in competency. And I think we have seen dozens of examples, hundreds of examples over the last few years. I mean, th this is essentially uh, the way school shooters develop. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Yeah, th this is just all to say you, you don't want to discourage boys, men, girls as well who, oh, are, who are inclined to this, right, from pursuing competency. And this isn't, this isn't a, you know, men's right activist thing. We're very much in the camp of don't discourage anyone from following their passions and developing into good people at all. Don't let on on basically any basis don't if someone wants to do something wants to become competent in something like good on you but that's exactly what you should be doing so exactly do it absolutely so should we move on a bit i think i think that was uh more than enough on that stanza Definitely. there but uh, it was a good one i it was yeah i like that one number 33 you should eat your meals early unless you're visiting a friend a hungry man sits and gets sluggish, and his wits are impaired. So to me, I think this is this is all about preparedness. L like literally knowing where your next meal is coming from, essentially. You know, if, if you eat your meal early when you have the opportunity to, that's the nuance I'm getting from this anyway. You know, there you have time to figure out where your next meal is going to come from. But if you're visiting a friend, maybe you can have that... Uh, that little bit of um, expectation that things are going to be okay there, that wherever you're going, you, you know, you, you can expect to have food. A friend, in this case, could mean literally, you know, you're going to visit your friend's house and, and you know, they're going to be preparing dinner. But it could also mean, you know, you're, you're going somewhere safe and familiar where the social norms are something that you understand and you understand that you can go into a restaurant and pay the currency that you that you have on you you know, in your bank card or whatever and receive some food or goods and services in exchange for that. And you can be confident in that fact and, uh, 
And so, you, you know, you, you're not necessarily going to be worried about having enough to eat or having water or shelter or whatnot, because you can't expect that that's going to be accessible to you. So I think that's, that's what this is saying to me. For sure. As well, it's, it's more fun to eat with a friend. And so it, a lot of times people will go out with their friend to eat. So I definitely see that that is just sort of that communal bonding over a meal, which is one of the most common things in the, in the history of the world and between humans. And, uh, I just want to add at the end where they talk about being sluggish and impaired wits. And it just reminded me of, um, being hangry where you just get hungry and then it's, you know, you're grumpy. Well, it's like those Snickers commercials where, you know, you turn into Joe Pesci from like Goodfellas and Hey man, you're not yourself. It's, it's very, even, if even then they had, yeah. we aren't sponsored by Snickers. No, but good commercials. <laughs> um, and it, again, I, I think it's funny that something so normal and common is here in a, a book of, of wisdom because it's, because it is so normal and common that, you know, just make sure you eat so that you're not hangry. And then, you know, if you're going out with a friend, again, be prepared and make sure that you have what you need to be able to eat again. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I, I mean, hangry is, is, is certainly one way of putting it And there. And there's also, I think another story of Dr. Peterson's is something like he's dealt with people who had, you know, serious anxiety or depression or something like that. And then he finds out that they barely eat anything at all. And he just gets them to start eating a good breakfast and they completely change around their mental state, something like that. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's just, that's just, you know, eat breakfast. That's a, that's a good, uh, definitely good bit of wisdom. So, or at least make sure you're eating enough, blah, blah, blah. There's people who do, you know, the intermittent fasting sure. thing or whatever, but you know, yeah. If you're eating enough, that's yeah. Back to the poem. It's a long and crooked walk to a bad friend, even if he lives nearby, but it's an easy road to a good friend, no matter how long the journey. This is one of my favorites from the whole, whole book here, the whole poem. Okay. So two sides to this, I think there's, there's the, the bad friend and the good friend and saying that the, the bad friend is, you know, a long and, and crooked walk, even if he lives nearby. I think this says something about two things. It's the things that a bad friend will make you do to continue to be their friend, something like that, whether they're taking things from you or making you do things that you're uncomfortable with, you know, peer pressure or something like that, or, or the things that are just bad for you in general. Maybe you don't, maybe you don't care, but you know, you're, you go along with it because, Hey, this, this person's good. This person's, you know, nice and comfortable to be around sort of thing. So you just go along with it. And, uh, it, well, I think it really just, just says it's, it's an effort to maintain that sort of a friendship, whether it's conscious effort, you know, you, you have a hard time dealing with that person and you actually know it, something like that, but you know, maybe you've got history together, some loyalty sort of thing, and that's in play, but it could also be just something like, you know, just being around a bad friend is gonna, is going to take something out of you, whether you know it or not. And, and that's the the first side of it but then the flip side is obviously you know a a good friend you know i i think what what this one is actually saying it's it's an easy road to a good friend no no matter how long the journey you know it's it's worth keeping up with the people that are who who want the best for you it's it's worth maintaining those those friendships and you know surrounding yourself with people who want the best for you. You, you maybe it's maybe you live physically far away or you know you have schedules that are hard to match up sometimes but you know if you make that effort and make time for for one another i i think what this really implies is that both people are going to come out better for it and and so this this is just one of the best little nuggets of wisdom here i think of this whole book definitely when I read it, it immediately made me think of have it, when you try and do something that you, you hate or you know is, you know, wasting your time, that kind of thing, but you kind of, you kind of have to, to maintain appearances, which I think if you're visiting a, a bad friend, that's what you're doing. And it's just a drudge. Like it's so hard to get motivated to do. Whereas if you're going to see a good friend, you're, you're excited for it. And it doesn't, again, it, yeah, it doesn't matter how long the journey is because you 
you're happy to do it. But and I think one of the takeaways from that is, well, surround yourself with good people and, and do things that, that are good for you. So there are things that are annoying that you have to do to live and all that kind of stuff. Responsibilities. Absolutely. But it's, it, it's definitely different from doing things that, you know, are sort of actively going against your best interest. And it, they're just, they're hard to do. They're hard to get motivated to do. So yeah, it's a good, it's a good, uh, it's a good verse. I agree. I, I like your, your point about doing things that maybe you're not completely enthusiastic about as well. I think that also touches on, you know, the idea that some people are just not interested in, in certain things. And so, I mean, you know, pushing people into one career path or another, if they're just not interested in that, it's it's something that they're not going to to want to do. They're not going to want to spend the effort, spend the time on. I mean, I think this actually also implies something to do with it's worthwhile to spend the time and the effort on something that is going to be beneficial for oh, definitely. you. Definitely. Right. So it's, uh, it's something that, uh, implies that, that, that you should seek those things out, seek out those things that are going to be good for you and beneficial for you, but also that, that interests you that, so that you, so that you can justify making that long journey and it's going to be enjoyable for you and whatever you get out of it on the other side is going to actually be worthwhile for you. So for sure. Shall we move on? Good with me. Back to the poem. You should keep moving. You should never be a guest forever in any one place. Your welcome will wear out if you stay too long beneath another's roof. So this one, I think the the theme that it touches on is essentially self-reliance. You don't want to be a burden on others. And, and I think that's what staying too long in one place really means. You, you know, maybe the, the, it could be talking about something like wearing out your welcome, right? If you, if you stayed too long in at a party or something like that and everyone's gone home, but you're still there drinking and eating food while the hosts are, are cleaning up sort of thing, you're, you're kind of being a bad guest in that particular scenario. But at the, the broader theme, I think is something like self-reliance this is sort of maybe in a literal sense it's kind of implying um couch surfing or something like that but at the very least if you're if you're couch surfing for one night then you got another buddy for another night or something like that at least you're not being a a weeks months long leech in 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 one particular place but the the broader theme i think is something more like self-reliance uh don't put yourself in the situation where you would have to be a guest forever or or if you're the wanderer like odin at least you have some kind of a um a handle on you know how you're going to take care of yourself and you're not going to be specifically reliant on being a guest in in one spot or something like that for sure and i know in the the previous episode on the Havamal, we talked a lot about hospitality and how it's a two-way street. And so there, there was a lot in the previous episode about when a guest comes to your place, you're supposed to uh, provide, you know, drink and food and a warm blanket and that kind of thing. And this is the, this is what the, the guest is sort of supposed to do in return is that they aren't supposed to leech off you forever. And again, yes, being self-reliant is a big part of that, that they would, you're not being a freeloader or a parasite. And, and I I really like too, what you said about uh, keep, uh, you have to keep moving that I think is very true because you stagnation is, uh, one in this particular instance, you don't want, yeah, if you're stagnating and living on someone else's dime, then it's disrespectful, but it's bad. It's really bad for you, you know, in your soul. Like it's, it's not, uh, you're not helping yourself at all. It's, and it will eat away at you. Yeah. I mean, these days, I, I think it's in a lot of cases you have to, first of all, not take this stuff exactly. Literally. That's not the only way it's, it's applicable. And, and I mean, you know, the Bible and other traditions do it too, where it's, you know, a story in parable form, sort sure. of something like that. This is a little more condensed, but I, I think it's a mistake to think that that's the only specific example it's referring to these days. I think the, you know, couch surfing for lack of a better term is one example, but a better example, like you mentioned is something like, you know, you're, you're living off the, 
the the welfare of others. Well, you, yeah, you're living on welfare or something like that. And you know, there's cases where people have to do that for some kind of a physical disability or something like for that, sure. or mental disability or whatnot. And and I mean, those are certainly the cases where. And we're going to get into verses that absolutely talk about the necessity for society to you know be there for the people that that need it sort of thing that Definitely. you know are, are down right that we're gonna get there so that's not what i'm saying i'm not saying you know get rid of it sort of thing but you know i, I think uh, if, if something is available for for free and you know you, you have the option of living off of you know the the government or something like that you know some people take it and and they just uh, you know they don't strive for anything uh, beyond that, and uh, you know, I think uh, this is just saying something like you shouldn't you shouldn't get yourself to a place where you are dependent on that, and uh, and you know, at least be working on getting yourself out of that situation. So for sure, and especially like in ca- the cases of welfare and, and things like that, it is it is uh, very hard. I'd say on on like most recipients, like there is a I, again, I'll I'll say it, you know, sort of using. Uh, religious language where it's harmful to your soul and that's not an admonishment of people who go on it it's more a recognition that while you're on it there is peril and that there is a there is a risk that well you can it's very easy actually to, like to fall into you know clinical depression because you're on it because you, every, everyone wants to be useful no one wants to you know just be a lump on a log and that's the that's sort of the the danger of it is that you if if you're on welfare you can you can take that on that feeling of oh you're not uh you're not being useful and it just it, it'll lead away at you and then you'll you'll get you'll you'll really get yourself into a downward spiral and that uh so i could go i could go on about this a little bit more but i i won't go too much further just that um, there, there has to be a way specifically with welfare to be able to get people off of it in a healthy way that will sort of re- reinvigorate them. And basically we don't want people hitting rock bottom and they're, they're sort of that, the, the veil, the very real risk of that when, when someone is on welfare, that they could spiral out. Well, and, and maybe, People need to hit rock bottom sometimes, but I think I, probably what we more meant is you don't want people living on rock bottom, exactly. staying there. Yes, yeah. yeah. So no, no, it's it's a it's a complex issue, and and certainly we're we're not seeing anything to the effect of you know welfare should be abolished, blah blah blah, or or you know the people who would take advantage of this, which I I think this stanza is really going against those people who take would advantage in, for sure intentionally be in this sort of a situation. You know that's that's a thing. But it's it's much smaller than, uh, say, Republicans in the states uh, make it out to be as far as an issue goes, right? So exactly. It's it's something that's necessary for society. But, you know, the message here is something like, you know, if, if you have to be dependent on others, on the, the hospitality of, of, uh, of, you know, your state or your society, you know, maybe you should actually try and uh, get yourself out of that place or, or at least you know, maybe keep moving here. Maybe in, in this analogy, it's at least you try something new. You try some other way of, of getting out of your situation there and bringing yourself up, uh, onward and upward. So I think that's, that's what this is saying. And, and honestly, I think it's, it's, it's hopeful. It sort of says, you know, here's the answer for getting yourself out of, you know, some kind of a depression or something like that. You, you know, if it's, if it's, if it's not going well for you, maybe change something up and try something different because what's the worst case scenario you're still going to be where you are like try something new try something different and actually the next two verses uh at least from what i got out of them they kind of uh they lead out of this very nicely and we're going to do uh verse 36 and 37 because they they go well together so back to the poem it's better to have a home even if it's little Everyone should call somewhere home. Even if you own just two goats beneath a faulty roof, that's still better than begging. Better to have a home, even if it's little. Everyone should call somewhere home. Your heart will be wounded if you have to beg for every meal from somebody else. Yeah, I think you're exactly right that this this ties into the same whole point that 
you know, you should try and have something for yourself, some security, some familiar territory that is yours. If you have that, you know, at the very least, you, you've got the basics of society to be able to, you know, maybe start saving money and, and getting, uh, getting some, uh, you know, nicer possessions or things like that that make life easier. And then maybe you're able to put more time into, uh, you know, your job or, or education or something like that and get yourself, get yourself going. This is saying what the bare minimum is, which is, you know, having a home, right? So definitely, uh, well, it doesn't have to be much, right? But it's, it's, it's something. And maybe that gets into a little bit of the idea of the the Pareto principle, you know, it's, it's very, very hard if you have nothing, if you have zero to start to get something. But as soon as you have any bit, any bit of something, as soon as you have something, you can get more. Definitely. No, that's a, I actually hadn't thought of the Pareto principle for that, but no, that, that's definitely true. And I think too, it's a, it's a call to be uh, thankful as well that, you know, even if you only have two goats, it's still like, that's, two goats. That's not bad. You can get milk and cheese and whatever. I mean, I wouldn't, I don't think I'd recommend killing them to eat them because then you're, you've only got one goat then. And what are you going to do with just one goat? But be, be thankful for what you have. There, there are worse situations and they talk about, and very similar to what I was saying, that your heart will be wounded if you're begging for everything. Because again, no one wants to, to live based off the the charity of others. And that sort of sounds harsh, but it's, there's a a very real vulnerability if you have to beg for every meal and it to have to go through that state of vulnerability every time just to eat is it's a very, it's, it's very demanding on, on your, on your person, on your heart, on your soul. So it, so, you know, be thankful for what you have, even if, even if it's not great, be thankful for it because you, you could have less, you could have nothing and having something just like you were saying with creative principle, it means that it's more likely that you're going to get more. You're not, you have momentum on your side. So, yeah. And, and maybe, uh, maybe now that I think about it a little more, maybe the Pareto principle might be the, the description of it, but I think it's, it's actually the Matthew principle is, is what it's, what it's called. And it's, okay, to do, yes. it's the, the phrase, I might be getting this wrong. Something like, uh, to those who have nothing, uh, more shall be taken to those who have something more shall be given something like something that. Like that. Uh, I definitely got it wrong some, somehow, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's the idea. That's, that's another description of this. You know, if, if you are at, zero it's going to be incredibly hard to to get anywhere further but if you if you have anything at all you've got momentum you've got the the ability to do more and i mean this is why there's you you know the there was a study that just came out at the time of recording anyway something like the the global one percent is set to have two-thirds of all wealth by 2030 something like that and there's parts of society that's just completely freaking out right now because that just looks so bad. But, you know, if if you're uh, if you have a computer and you're reading the Guardian report on this uh, on this uh, study, you're in the global one percent. Probably the, you, you can, you no. can actually you, you can get uh, really, really cheap uh, smartphones now. And, and maybe you are actually maybe in your you're in the global 10 percent or something like that. But anyway, the. The privileged few is is still not that uh, not that uh, um, monolithic of a group sort of thing. You, you know, people who might not necessarily think they're in the global one one percent. You actually are, but uh, you know, inequality is still is a social issue. It's still a social problem. But it's it's uh, it's the wrong answer to say that inequality um, should just be replaced with. Uh, you know, take all the things away from the people who have something because those are the people who are who are motivated to to go and make make more for themselves. And it's it's a it's a, again it's another complex issue, but it's it's something that uh, um, this stands at this example is I think getting into something where you know at least get yourself to the level where you have a base somewhere to start, and then you can start trying to climb that particular hierarchy and. For sure. Be better for yourself. Definitely. All right. uh, Moving on to verse 38. Never go even a single step without a weapon at your side. 
you never know when you might find yourself in need of a spear. So this is another good one. It's, uh, I, I think, something to do with preparedness again. You know, being prepared to, you know, be, if you're in a dangerous situation, be able to get out of it, right? And I mean, it's not necessarily always going to be the case that you need to have weaponry per se to get out of a bad situation. I think in in last the the last episode there was something like you know your wits or or what you need in a in a bad situation sort of thing. But uh, I think this is acknowledging the idea that you you know at least have enough on you, at least have something there with you that you can rely on to get yourself out of a bad situation because you know you you don't want to be that person that is completely um uh, about the camera oops uh you don't want to be that sort of person um who um is just putting themselves out there to be a victim essentially by being completely unprepared definitely yeah so yes i i see it too as a as a call to not be completely useless be competent and be competent and and self-reliant and actually as i'm i'm looking at this first which on the surface doesn't seem to have much to do with the previous ones about uh you know having a home and that kind of thing but i think it's a another call of self-reliance that be be a competent member of your of your society and be able to be, be able to exist in the world where there's chaos is really what it's calling for is that you need to be prepared because there is chaos and you're going to encounter it and confront it and so you, you need to be able to you need you need to be able to hold yourself against it and that's in, on a larger scale is what it's what it's calling for is that you it, you need to be prepared to face off against chaos and that you know at every step exactly you, you need to uh, be capable of uh, of defending yourself you know you, you need to have that ferocity that that ability to become a monster in the case where you need that to, uh, to survive. Right. And, you know, that could be through literally a weapon or that can be through, you know, being competent at some form of, uh, martial art that trains you to be able to, uh, you know, handle yourself in a, in a bad situation when it goes bad sort of thing. Uh, I think another idea that Jocko says, Jocko Willing says is, uh, you know, you're, you're, only as good as your training or something like that, or your, for sure. you, the way you train is the way it's going to come out in, uh, in uh, a real situation sort of thing. And so, you know, you, you need to train yourself for those situations and be able to be competent in those sorts of situations. And then you'll survive and your family will survive and your tribe will survive, et cetera, et cetera. So. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's great. Moving on. Yeah. Uh, verse 39, back to the poem. I have never met a man so gen generous, nor so hospitable, that he would not welcome repayment. Nor have I met a man so giving that he'd turn down a thing offered in return. So I think this one is is pretty uh, pretty descriptive of the social contract, um, and what and what I mean by that is, you, you know that that uh, that contract of reciprocity that people develop for one another to you know build trust, build friendships, and and I think what this is saying here is that, you know, if, if you refuse, um, you know, what, what someone deems to be what whatever you did for them is worth, you're putting yourself on a higher level than them. You're saying, oh, no, 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 like I'm going to just just keep uh, doing things for you. And then that that obliges the other person to kind of do something um, right back for you. So if you accept, you know a gift or maybe literally some payment or something like that for a favor done for you or whatnot. Um, that keeps you on the same level is how I see it is that it keeps, uh, it keeps, uh, maybe the unconscious subconscious tally that's in your head for, you know, where you stand between yourself and your friend or whoever, whatever person you're, you're, uh, dealing with here, that unconscious tally stays at, at zero, no one person is uh, has something over the other person, and that just lets the relationship be upfront and honest and uh, above board. And uh, yeah, it it uh, it doesn't 
in debt one person to another, which I think is what this is getting at. For sure. I actually have uh, written down to repay your debts and uh, remind me of, I think it's the Lannister family in Game of Thrones. Lannister always pays his debts. And it's a, it's a, it's a great way to be. And it's how, how you should be in the world. And actually we've said it a number of times in the podcast, uh, mostly because I think, uh, Jordan Peterson says it, but you know, you don't get anything for free and you, you always have to pay your debt. So why not do it consciously and do it, you know, in a forthright manner so that you're not, it doesn't come to collect when you're not expecting it. As, and as well with the social contract, I mean, one of the quick ways to annoy people is to be a freeloader and have people spend money on you and then you never do anything in return. I know, especially like when I was younger and my family would go visiting relatives or whatever, and they were hosting us, you know, if we were there for a week, like my, my uh, parents would, you know, pay for, you know, you know, a meal every second night kind of thing or that kind of thing. It's sort of that you're, you're just trying to keep it on an even keel so that you're not freeloading. You're not being a parasite. You're not being a jerk about it. Yeah, definitely. And, 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 uh, well, it ties back into a couple of stanzas ago, I think, honestly, like the value of, uh, being able to hold your own. Right. So I think this also a couple of other sides to this, this whole equation here is that it, 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 lets you put value on your work, your time, yourself in general. If you don't accept payment for that, maybe subconsciously you don't think you you did anything worthwhile, right? And and that could be that could be something like a self-esteem issue or something like that. You know, there's there's oh, don't worry about it. You you know, like I'll get you later. Oh, there's, for sure. th- there's that kind of a thing, but then there's also, you know, if you've done a, an actual favor for for somebody and and it's kind of like you you're insisting at not being paid or something like that you you know that's it could be on the one hand that you are actually indebting the person to you but but on the other hand maybe you're not valuing valuing yourself enough and i I again i think if if someone offers you know there's no reason not to to take that uh you know you don't have to be a martyr as well there's a i think there's the potential for psychological damage to yourself if you if you always decline payment in one form or another for the things that you do for people maybe that you actually start to get resentful that oh, people definitely. that people don't uh, reciprocate or something like that because you know they just expect that you'll do these things or at least you perceive that people expect that you'll do these things for free when you know maybe you've just declined and maybe that's the situation you want to be in always being the victim or something like that. I've certainly known people like that. So for sure. No, I, I have too. Yeah. It, it's usually, it's usually pretty funny too, because you offer payment for something they've done, you know, whether, and it could just be, they did something for you. So you're going to take them out for a beer, the kind of thing, uh, which is often an appropriate, uh, you know, debt payment. And then, the, you know, they say no, they say no. And then eventually they, they come back with, oh, you've never appreciated anything I do. It's like, well, you said no every time. Like, I don't know what you want from me. Yeah. No. So it's in a lot of these cases with hospitality, it's again, it's two way street that to play the game, you have both parts have to be played. There has to be, if you're going to pay the debt, the, the debt repayment has to be accepted and, you know. Yeah, exactly. Again, I just I, I think it's a description of of the social contract, the way the world works, so that everyone uh, doesn't want to kill each other all the time. Exactly. So, all right, back to the poem, verse forty-one. Oh, actually, verse forty. I don't know why I keep missing one of the zeros. Do not be so sparing in using your money that you don't use it for your own needs. Often what you save for your children will end up in the hands of your enemies. Many things will go worse than you expect. Yeah, so this one, I can't help but uh, but think of the Petersonian concept or phrase that he uses, you know, aim for the highest good, but take care of the day. So it's something to do with balance, you know, 
maybe you have this great goal, this thing that you're saving up for, whether it's, you know, in today's practical life, that could be a vacation, you know, somewhere you want to go, you've wanted to go forever and it's going to be a great experience for you or you're saving for your retirement or your, your children's education or your children's future or, or what have you. But what this is saying is don't, don't do that to the complete detriment of living an enjoyable life. I think that's what this is really, really saying. And it, it's got a, a really a sinister twist to it here because it's not just necessarily that you're, uh, you're maybe going to uh, not get, you're not going to enjoy life sort of thing if, if all you do is save or, or whatever, something like that. It, it, it actually, well, it says it, it might end up in the hands of your enemies. You know, maybe you fail. Maybe you lose all your savings. Maybe maybe something happens in your life, you, you know, where where you, you just lose everything that you've been you've been saving up. And then and then what do you have to show for it at the end of the day? And and uh, I, I think it really is just some kind of a uh, something to do with balance. And I mean, have that aim have that thing that you're saving up for because that's that's valuable that's a good thing to do but still take care of yourself still enjoy life still do the things that make you happy and and you know maybe maybe that takes some money away from the this other goal but you know if you're going to be just completely unhappy or or you know you you're going to uh Maybe you're you're going to lose sight of that goal or something like that. Maybe that's another way of putting this this nuance here is maybe you eventually lose sight of that goal or it becomes unattainable for you because you are just such a a, a wretched person because you're depriving yourself. For sure. Right. So so don't do that. Strike that balance. I didn't even thought of that uh, becoming a, a wretched person because of deprivation. But no, I think I think uh, I think that's a good. Uh, observation for uh, what I took some of what I took from it is that you should definitely buy what you need and then I contrast that with w what you want because there are things that you absolutely need in life uh, you know food shelter that kind of thing so definitely spend money on it like don't don't go without if you have the resources for it uh, in order to uh, save for this, you know, long-term future goal because you're not you're not in a position where you can. You don't have the surplus resources for that. You have to you do have to take care of yourself. And I think there is a a great value in taking care of yourself in the here and now, so that you can actually get better, get more competent, and then be able to save for these future goals in a way that it doesn't cost you as much, so that. You know, you can you can build yourself up to a point where it's not as well, just as costly to your to your person. And and actually, just looking at, I just got a spark of an idea with, when it says often what you save for your children will end up in the hands of your enemies. If you if you deprive yourself in order to save for these lofty goals at the beginning, when when you weren't taking care of your needs, and we're we'll be very clear on that, like taking. Like you need to take care of your needs. This isn't about like, oh, you really want something and oh, maybe I'll go out and get it now, even though I don't really have the money for it, but it's going to make me happy. So I'm going to do it. It's taking care of your needs. So I've seen this a lot and I've probably done it myself where you don't take care of what you need in the, in the moment so that you can have something in the future. But then you end up spending money on medicine or physiotherapy or something that will fix you in the future because something, you know, something has gone worse than you expected. And, you know, it, they're not like enemies knocking at your door with swords, but, you know, injury and uh, sickness and disease are definitely enemies. And they're going to, they are going to come for you. But you can lessen the chance of that if you are taking care of yourself in the here and now. There's a lot of evidence that suggests that people who are less stressed and less uh, what um, what well, more, more happy maybe that's the the better way to put it are, are actually healthier, right? For sure. And so that's part of that balance. I mean, there, there's two sides of it. You, you mentioned you know the the idea of needs and wants. 
I think this is this is also saying something to the effect of if you if you have that surplus, you don't necessarily have to put everything away. You know, even if you've taken care of your needs and you're generally healthy because you have taken care of those needs. But if you want something that, you know, isn't going to throw you off the wagon. So so let's let's be clear about that. You know, if you want to have pizza every night or donuts or something like that, maybe maybe don't indulge that one. But, you know, if, if you want something that's going to enrich your life or or, uh, you know, help you to enjoy the enjoy the journey, something like that. And maybe that takes, uh, you know, a little bit away from your long-term goal, but the, the, the road is going to be easier and more enjoyable for you. I think that is a worthwhile in, investment in yourself where you're, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't necessarily worry about getting, you know, a thing here or a thing there that is a want, but not a need, but you know, it's, it's not, uh, it's not derailing you from your goal sort of thing. Exactly. You should, you should have a little bit in your budget for, you know, entertainment or for, you know, uh, a, a new phone or a tablet or something like that, where maybe you don't need one, but, but, but Hey, you know, you got that in your budget and yeah. makes you happy for at the time sort of thing. So it, you could look at the the pure financial equation of you know compound interest and everything if you save every possible penny that you have okay you'll have more at the end but again what what are you going to get out of life for it you know there's a, a to me i i think something like you only live once you know hashtag yolo whatever it, that's a two-sided thing right you know you only live once therefore be hedonistic and indulge yourself sort of thing that's that's the one side of it but then you know there's you only live once and don't uh, don't completely deprive yourself as you're going that's maybe the, the sure. flip side of it so i agree i think that's a good observation all right uh back to the poem 41 friends should provide their friends with weapons and clothing this kind of generosity shows Generous mutual giving is the key to lifelong friendship. So I think this is actually a, this is very good in that it builds on uh, two stanzas ago, the the social contract idea. So now we're getting into, I think, more directly the, the concept of friendship, much more directly. I think it, the, the next 10 or so stanzas are going to be all about that, actually. And I think this is the foundation of that, really, is that you know, you have that reciprocity between yourself and your friend and you both want the best for each other. And if you have an opportunity to give your friend some kind of a, a resource or something that you've got that will help them, you know, the, the implication is that they're going to do the same for you and you're both going to build yourselves up together. And, you know, it's a rising tide sort of situation, you know, if, if you and your friends all want the best for each other and you, and you lift yourselves up that way, you can get further than if you were isolating yourself and going at it alone. So. Absolutely. And I look at it too. I see in in this, in this particular case, friends are providing each other with weapons and clothing. You know, what are weapons and clothing? Well, they're they're weapons and protection from chaos in in the world. So it's basically friends having each other's back. And that, that is, it's exactly right when they say that's how you build lifelong friendship is that the more the two of you face uh, chaos together and the more that you protect each other from chaos and fight it back together, the bond becomes very like unbreakable. I mean, in a very real way, look at soldiers. I mean, they become closer than blood brothers and you know, they're, they're right up next to up, like up next to chaos, you know, day in and day out. And so that, that's how you, you build that deep, that deep bond where you would do anything for each other. And, and the, that type of relationship does last a lifetime. So and and it's good for society like the more bond the the more deep bonds you have like that in society the stronger society is going to be because you know if other if people have someone else that's got their back they can depend on them when things go wrong and they don't have to look to society as a whole to um to help them so yeah it's uh 
I really like this verse. It really captures something uh, important about living in society and having friends. I agree. I, I like it as well. Uh, you, you know, you, you mentioned that it's talking about, you know, weapons and clothing and, and, you know, that's, that's the tools for fighting chaos. So, so maybe to emphasize that it, these are tools, right? If you can give your, fr- you, you know, there's, there's the difference between, you know, giving your friend uh, a meal and, you know, teaching them, how to, you know, teach yeah. a man to fish sort of thing, but it's, it's giving them the, the tools, right? So, so this is, I think the way that you, you actually build yourselves up is, is, um, it's not by, you know, some sort of mundane tally of, you know, you each have to give each other these material goods. No, it's, it's, it's giving each other the tools and the support to be able to tackle whatever part of the unknown that you happen to want to be facing. So, it, a small nuance there, but I think it's important yeah, just to just to recognize that it's it's something like you are um, you're going for something that it, that is going to have greater benefits long term than maybe the the value of the things exchanged. Uh, you, you yes. know, yeah. you know what I mean. It's going to have greater benefit in the long term by by making by building each other up by supporting your friends and and uh, you, you know. You could think of it selfishly, like it's an investment, you know, if, if you support people around you and then they'll support you sort of thing. But I don't want to be that cynical, right? I don't want to be, I don't want to be cynical about this. You know, you're, it doesn't have to be a selfish thing. I think it's better to just want the best for your friends, the people around you. And, you know, they will return the favor if they're worth having around. So. Absolutely. All right. Uh, back to the poem, and so we'll be looking at uh, verse 42. Be a friend to your friend, and repay each gift with a gift. Repay laughter with laughter, repay treachery with treachery. Okay, so this is the stanza that we um, actually asked about on uh, Facebook, and did, did we... we Put it on a Twitter and Instagram as well. Again, yes. I think we'll, we'll social media in general. Yeah, exactly. We'll we'll coordinate that out in the future. And I think the the biggest reason for this one being ambiguous. Well, the question we asked was uh, was essentially, uh, you, you know, is is this a call to vengeance, a call for moderation? You know, what about honesty and always telling the truth? And that was, I think, my biggest uh, my biggest issue with this stanza is that it it to me repay treachery with treachery might contradict, you know, the, the other values that they're talking about, you know, being, uh, not honest for the sake of being honest, but y- you know, uh, being truthful, precise in your speech, a whole bunch of other themes and that sort of reciprocity of building people up. Maybe this is contradicting that. So I think that's why we, uh, we put that out onto social media and why that's, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we f- freely admit that we don't have all the, the good ideas here. Uh, you know, we, we don't know everything and we, we want, uh, we've been telling people, you know, tell us how, how we're wrong sort of thing. But, you know, we thought it was, uh, going to be a good idea to maybe, um, ask for some, some better answers sure. that, that might, uh, uh, work a bit better for us. So, uh, we, we posted quite late. It was actually just, uh, just the day before we recorded. So didn't get a whole lot of response on, on that, but we'll, we'll make sure that it's, uh, it's earlier in the week before we record that we, uh, you know, we've started to go through the, uh, whatever we're going to be covering and, uh, and you know, we, we have some questions that, uh, we might want to pose to, uh, people on social media. So, uh, keep an eye out for that on, uh, you know, Facebook, Twitter, and, uh, you know, let us know, uh, what you think. Uh, and, uh, so in that spirit, I'll start with, uh, the response we got from, uh, Simon Hall on Facebook. So he said, I see it as a call to moderation for sure. Similar to the biblical concept of taking an eye for an eye or a tooth for the tooth. It keeps the weights of judgment and honor balanced on both sides in a way that's non-bureaucratic and easy to reason about. I think it also seems to align with the karmic principle of sowing good to reap good and evil for evil. So I like that comment a lot. And actually, I think that might have also tied into a little bit of this social contract stuff. Like you're you're trying to do something in a way that's non-bureaucratic, uh, to, to reference the comment there, you know, that I think that also describes, you know, 
repayment isn't always exactly a one to one tally sort of thing, but it's just how you maintain your your friendship sort of thing. But you know, to me, the biggest problem I think I had with this is that you know, you're if you go negative with someone who's gone negative with you, you know, that's just going to be a vicious cycle sort of thing. But I think this is maybe the the nuance here that that I think Simon helped me clear up a little bit here was you know that that it's just a proportional response you know if if um if someone wrongs you in in any sort of way or treachery or whatever you you don't want to let that uh um them walk all over you there's got to be some sort of a consequence and and I think that is at least what this stanza is getting at and um you, you know it, it might not necessarily um be saying that it's always wrong to to lie or to be treacherous or whatnot, which is something that I maybe have a little bit of a problem with right now. But I think the idea of it being a, a proportional response and, you know, this is an idea that comes across a lot in different traditions, obviously. And I like that, uh, you know, Simon brought up different, uh, um, different traditions, examples from, you know, Christianity, you form uh, Eastern ideas of karma. Great to see that these ideas are, are not, uh, not isolated. So, um, definitely that was helpful for my understanding of the, uh, of this, uh, stanza. So thank you to Simon. And, uh, and I hope that, uh, that in, in the future that will, uh, will, uh, you know, those of you who are listening or watching here, please get involved and get onto Facebook and, and Twitter and, and help us out. Absolutely. Educate us, please. <laughs> we could use it. Yeah, I agree with, uh, with Simon quite a bit. I really like the that point you made at the end of the, the karmic principle of, you know, evil, uh, was it sowing evil and reaping evil and vice versa. And I saw it too, as a, as a, a call to moderation. Again, um, I've got the same examples, eye for an eye and which was not, which in the Bible was used as, as a call to moderation. So if someone took out your eye, you would, you would be owed their eye kind of thing rather than, you know, their eye, their tongue and their daughter. Like it's, it's meant to make sure that everything stays reasonable, I guess is the way to put it. And I know in popular culture, I don't think that's a, I don't think Vikings are often uh, seen as like reasonable. They would, uh, I, I think the common con- uh, perception of it would be that, you know, someone stole their goat, so they're going to blood eagle them or something like that. And I th- we've definitely, I think we've been led to believe that by TV shows and that kind of thing. And plus, it's cool to think about, like, you know, Vikings are like, you mess with me and I'm going to, you know, destroy you in ways you couldn't even imagine. And it, it is fun to think about that, but it's not, it's not conducive to society at all because it will, uh, it will build up uh, feelings of resentment and because even if the punishment for an action is fair, there might be some resentment, but it, I think overall in society, it'll be, there'll be an understanding that, okay, this, this was a crime that was committed. The punishment for it is this, which seems to be a reasonable punishment and it's been done. Okay. That this matter is now over. We can move on from it. If the reaction is, or the, the punishment is, uh, too severe, or not severe enough, and you you brought that up, and I'll, I'm going to touch on that in a second. It, but if, if it doesn't if it doesn't sort of match up, then there is a feeling that justice hasn't been served, that the it's imbalanced, and th- that's how resentment grows. Uh, but with the call to pay treachery with with treachery, it's not saying turn the other cheek, and that's a big a big deal. It's saying that if someone does wrong to you, something has to happen. And I think that that's a very important point because you, again, you don't want to be a doormat. You don't be, don't want to be walked on. It's there, ha, there has to be uh, consequences for actions for harm that is done to you. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, I, I don't want to gloss over the, the language used here. It definitely implies that, you know, you have the right to be underhanded or dishonest with someone who has done that to you. 
And you know what? That's that's something that I still have a little bit of trouble reconciling into the rest of this system that gets built up here throughout the Havamal and throughout the other stories that really have practical examples of, of all of it in action. I think this one very much in particular kind of goes against that to me. But I like the the other sides of it that uh, that justify the the use and the example of it. So I don't I don't want to ignore something that's that's difficult to wrap my head around. But I do want to I do like that there are um, ways of interpreting it that that essentially just build it into you know this is how as society we are going to punish injustices or crimes and and really you know the Vikings you know they like you were saying, you know, they might have this reputation for being, um, you know, brutal and maybe they would be the ones to go and, um, you, you know, have disproportionate responses, but they, they had a concept called we're guild, which was, you, you know, the, I think that one is specifically referring to the price that you have to pay if you murder someone so that you don't, it doesn't turn into a big blood feud. And, uh, and you, you know, the entire society gets torn apart because people are going to keep escalating sort of thing. So they had that that concept sure. and and then that turned into you know what would eventually become english common law in the, for the anglo-saxons and go into today's legal system so that's pretty cool it is so thanks again to uh to simon for that uh that response and we hope to hear uh more responses in the future we'll definitely keep doing this because it was a big uh, big help definitely yes thank you simon so moving on to verse 43 back to the poem be a friend to your friend and also to his friend, but never be a friend to the enemy of your friend. So more than anything, I think this guy was really talking about loyalty. And, and I mean, it's, uh, first of all, something like, you know, if, if, if you have a friend who has another friend, you know, maybe you guys can also be friends. It, a way of, you, you know, maybe to be a little practical about it, like that's how you leverage your social networks or your networking to, you know, maybe get some career advancement or something like that. Or, you know, you get to know better people who might open some doors for you, but being less direct and then less on the practical application, you know, maybe you'll, maybe it's just, you know, your, your friend knows some other people who you might enjoy as well and enjoy that companionship and and you can get something good out of it but then the the flip side to it though is you know never be uh, a friend to an enemy of your friend i think that's really just something that could ruin a friendship you know if, if you're friends with two people who don't like each other you know someone is going to get their their feelings hurt or demand that you stop being friends or something like that and uh, you know i, I i've known for a practical example, you know, a couple who who has gotten together uh, after I knew both people and then they break up sort of thing and then they're enemies of each other. That's the only case where I sort of say, OK, there's maybe a little bit of wiggle room if you knew both people ahead of time. But, you know, the the result is that you you try and stay friends with two enemies. And I think eventually you have to you have to choose and you, you maybe you lose touch with the other person or you intentionally don't talk to them or something like that. But, yeah, this is all about loyalty, I think. And it, it underscores the importance of sticking by the people who mean something to you because that's going to, I think, reap more benefits than trying to be friends with your friend's enemy. For sure. I look at it too. I see if you're friends with someone and so friends in the way that the Havamal has been talking about it, where, you know, the bond is strong and you're both, you're both facing uh, chaos and helping to, I guess, buttress each other so that you can, carve out this little piece of order in your neck of the woods. And then you've got this uh, other person who is, you know, if they're their enemy, they're probably, I mean, it, it kind of literally means that they're bringing chaos into their, into their world. And why would you want to invite that chaos into your own world then by being their friend of the, en of the enemy? So I think that's sort of the idea of loyalty is that, you're, you're promising your friend that you're going to do your best not to increase the chaos in their life. And, uh, they are, they're promising the same thing out of loyalty to you. And so if you break that loyalty by inviting chaos specifically of their enemy, it's, uh, it's just, it, again, a big jerk move like that. That's betrayal. You know, it, it really is betrayal. And then that, uh, that, 
that invitation to that chaos just, well, in a lot of cases, it will wreck that friendship and then all the benefits of that friendship are gone. Yeah. And that's, that's, I think one of the key points there is, you, you know, why risk losing something that's good by trying to befriend someone new where you don't really know what that potential is. So first of all, on a practical level, there's that, but, but yeah, it really is just, it's, it's a betrayal if you, if you do that. And you, you know, I'm, I'm sure most people have experienced this in some way or another being one party or another, or I've seen it happen. And yeah, it's, it's not, it's not great when it, uh, when it goes there, you know, if, if you're, if you're in a group of friends and someone raises serious objections to, to, you know, someone else's friend or something like that, maybe they're not even their, their enemy, but they've got serious objections to it. You know, if, if that, uh, if your friends don't take your concerns seriously or whatnot, then that can really, you know, that, that can end, uh, your participation in that group or your friendship with certain people or whatever. And so, I mean, it's, it's, multifaceted and covers a lot of things definitely yeah all right uh moving on we've got uh three verses that cover a lot of the uh the same material 44 45 and 46 so back to the poem if you have a good friend and really trust him and want good to come of your friendship you should speak your mind with him exchange gifts visit him often but if you have another friend and you mistrust him, but want to benefit from him nonetheless, you should speak to him kindly, flatter him, and repay his treachery with your own. The same friend, if you mistrust him and suspect him to be false in his words, you should talk with him, laugh with him, but repay just what he gives you. Okay, so three ideas that build on each other, I think. So first, the the good friendship in the first stanza we're talking about here, that one I think is, you, you know, I, I won't say it's completely obvious, but it's it's pretty darn obvious what it's saying, you know, foster that good relationship, you know, visit them often, right? Like, try and maintain a, a level of that friendship and foster it and build it up. And, you know, that's going to go well for you, like we've seen in other other stanzas here it's 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 very uh uh in line with that uh i also like you know speak your mind with them if you have a truly good friendship you should be able to tell them when you believe they're not doing something right you know because it's because you have their best interests at heart not because you want to get something up on them or something like that so i so i like that then you go into you know you have a bad friend you know you got to be wary you have to uh, you, you have to tread carefully, sort of thing, and and it, it brings in you know repay treachery, right? But what I like here is that essentially it's it's I think it's implying that you you should get what you need out of this bad friendship. You're not going to be in it in a genuine way. That's like you're not necessarily looking out for the best for them because they obviously don't look the same way for you. You know, if they don't look out for your best interest, you don't necessarily look out for theirs, but that doesn't mean completely cut ties. That means, you know, talk with him, laugh with him and replay, repay what they give you. So I think it, I think what this really implies is that, you know, if, if you have a, if you have a bad friendship or, or maybe even you have to, you have to deal with someone out of necessity, you know, Show them the side of yourself that you want them to see and get out of it what you need to get out of it to move on and maybe get out of that situation sort of thing. So interesting little grouping for how you deal with different people, I think. I agree. It uh, And it says specifically repay his treachery with your own. So it, I think that actually supports the idea of that, that balance that... Um, what we're talking about with eye for an eye, it's a moderation. You're not, you're not going beyond what he is doing to you, but you are, you are repaying it. And I look at it kind of as a, a friendship, like you were saying. It, there's an idea that friendship can be based on a few different things. You have like the true friendship, where it's two people who have um, very similar, I guess, ideas about life, and they enjoy each other and all that kind of stuff. But then you can have friendship of location where you, you work together. So you're friends because, you know, you're in proximity, but 
when that person leaves the job, you don't really talk to them, but you still, it's a good enough relationship and you, you have no ill will towards that person. And then there's other ones where you're of benefit to them and they're of benefit to you and you're not really close. There's, there's definitely, it's not like a deep friendship, but both of you are benefiting. And I think that's a little bit of what, what we're seeing here is that you're, you're benefiting in the same way from them as they're going to be benefiting from you and you're repaying just what they give you. Yeah, I think I think this is something like it's not really going so far as to say take advantage of, of people mm. that that you don't like sort of thing. That that would be going too far, I think. But I think it definitely just just says like you know be in that situation and get out of it, and that's it. So I think it's I think it's neutral on how you deal with people um, who maybe are not necessarily the best friends. It's it's certainly clear in repay them. Certainly clear in that respect, but. I, I really think it is implying something like make sure you, you get what you need out of it. Otherwise sure. it's not going to be worth it at all. Exactly. So. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting, uh, progression there. It is. All right. Back to the poem, uh, verse 47. I was young once I walked alone and I became lost on my way. I felt like I was rich when I met another traveler. People's joy is in other people. So this one was really interesting for me. I I think I went to a few different places on this. First of all, honestly, my first reaction was specifically because it says, you know, I was young once. I think this is getting at some kind of idea of depression in youth, uh, specifically through isolation, you know, the feeling of not necessarily belonging to any one group or society because, you know, I think that's a, that's a really big issue for kids, you know, not necessarily getting along exactly right for whatever social groups might be available to them or around them. And then they get isolated and then they start getting depressed and then spirals on and on and on gets worse and worse and worse. And I mean, it's, it's a big problem. It's a, it's a big mental health issue. And to me, first of all, I think it's, it's incredibly uh, prescient that this is, you know, recognizing something like that way back in the day, you know, maybe in a society that was very structured, you know, because you had to live a certain way in order to just survive, that maybe there was still some, this sort of problem. Maybe this is not only a first world problem, you know, where you may feel isolated from your society or not belonging. And, and maybe you turn to some kind of a nonconformism because that's your way of expressing yourself. And, and, uh, and, you know, the, that just doesn't necessarily do anything except, emphasize how different you are and then it just spirals and yeah i i thought this was this was really interesting but then you, you know the, the flip side is that it turns into you know you 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 people feel valued and valuable when they're when you're a part of society and that's i think that's just something something major to to understand is that you know you, you can't go it alone so for sure I, humans are they are a communal people. They need communities to live in. And in fact, we, uh, it's, it's very detrimental. That's why there is such a thing as like, um, isolation and, uh, what do they call it? Like if you're a criminal to punish you that they, they solitary confinement and that will, uh, there are laws uh, pertaining to how long you can have someone in solitary confinement because it will, it'll mess someone up so quickly being alone. So that I think, I think it's recognition that people need people. I remember reading about, I think it was an orphanage in, in Russia, like Soviet Russia, where they had babies that didn't, uh, that didn't get touched other than to feed them, I think. And I don't, th I think most of them would die like before they were like two kind of thing. But then the other ones that, who were, who sort of went to the orphanage in uh, even worse conditions, you know, they were being held by the nurses and played with and interacted with and they, they flourished and it was, and the only difference was that one set had human interaction and the other one didn't. And so it, it, it's a real thing where people need it. So that, that's why you feel rich when, you know, you're going through something and you feel like you just, you just feel alone and like, Oh, I'm, you, you might not say this, 
specifically to yourself, but there is a feeling of no one else can understand me. But then when you find that person that does understand you, you're like, oh, it's not so bad. And then as, as soon as other people, as soon as you realize you, you are not that different from other people, it's like a, a weight's been lifted off your shoulders and yeah, you feel rich. Definitely. I, I really like that, uh, that translation because I think that's a, a, a very uh, good description of that feeling. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I I know that example as well. I think it was communist Romania, but oh, Romania, not- yeah, yeah, that's right. No, no, but yeah, I'm. It's starting to come back. Yeah, um, I, I I think I think you're exactly right about feeling rich. I mean, there there's an idea that you have to get a group identity as as a youth, as a teenager, whatever, and then you're able to branch out and be and become you know and uh, an individual become and. What what's the word like an actualized individual or something like that or actualized personality? I, I'm I think I'm mixing up a term here or there, but the idea is that you have to have a group identity in order to have those friends and have that base of support, and you don't feel isolated. And then you know you go off and become your own person, but you can do that with confidence. You can do that with some support. You can do that with people backing you up and. It's not going to be nearly as hard of a of a time as if you think you're you're just special is the wrong word. If you think no one understands you or or no one is exactly like you and you just have to forge your own path, that's incredibly isolating. And I Definitely. I know I know that that's like a thought that would go through my head or you you yeah. know like a uh but plenty of plenty of other kids right. So it's like yeah, it's funny because like you have a whole bunch of kids feeling isolated together and they just don't they just don't realize it until they're older and then yeah then they realize oh everyone felt this way and and then they think like crap it could have been so much easier if i had talked to this person and you know but yeah it's funny how that uh how that works out but and i guess it's a very it's a universal feeling that you know something from a thousand years ago is showing it like yeah it's still happening Exactly. No, I, I, I love this one just, just because it, I, I think it's, it's just so relevant today. Absolutely. As is most of the rest of this, but for some reason that one, I, I really like that one for, for that purpose alone. So for sure. And I think too, just thinking about what you're saying about finding your, your group or your tribe when you're young, it helps orient yourself in the world. And, and there's a whole bunch of things that you don't have to worry about now so that you can focus on figuring out who you are as an individual and grow out of and not even like grow out of it as in you leave the the group just you grow into your own person and figure out how you're going to be who you are and how that's going to you know help yourself help your family help the group help society at large kind of thing but you can't do that if you have to figure out how to orient yourself in the world on your own you're just going to spend all your time doing that because you only have that that one lifetime, whereas if you have that group or that society that has figured out a whole bunch of stuff for you, you don't you don't have to worry about a whole a whole set of problems, a whole set of chaos that society is sort of able to keep at bay for you while you figure out who you are. So yeah, I yeah. like that. I agree. All right, um, moving on to verse forty eight. So back to the poem. Kind, brave people live best. They never nurture a grudge. It's unwise to spend your life worrying, dreading your responsibilities. So, uh, two main themes to this one, I think. Uh, I don't necessarily think that the the key point of the first half here is about being kind or brave or whatnot. Th- those are good qualities for sure. But, you know, never nurturing a grudge. I think this gets into, you know, Again, something to do with consequences for actions. They should be appropriate, uh, um, proportionate to whatever wrong was was done to you, sort of thing. But you know, all the grudges is going to be ongoing resentment. And I mean, if something is if something hasn't been dealt with, that's that's sort of one thing. You're you're, you're justified in the sense that you know if if you perceive that justice has not been done. Okay, that that's that's a gray area, sure, but maybe the the answer is something like err on the side of not holding that grudge because that's just going to be something that is going to eat away at you, is going to foster that resentment, and then maybe another aspect to it is you're just going to be worrying about that. You're gonna you're gonna have that on your mind all the time, and that's going to 
just take away from your being able to, you know, live life without stress, being able to sleep and, you know, all those good things that are, uh, helpful for staying healthy and, uh, and, you know, a good, a good functioning member of society, you know, resentment and holding a grudge and constantly worrying anxiety and eroticism, you know, to put a, that, that being the proper term, you know, those are, those are things that make life harder. And this is just something that says, you know, it's unwise to spend your life that way. And certainly some people can't help it, you know, that's just part of their personality, but maybe they, maybe that's something that they might want to actually work on, actively work on, and their life might be better off for it. So, Yeah, and I, I look at it too. I, I think if you do have a, a kind and brave disposition, you're less likely to nurture a, a grudge just because you're able to just sort of put, put it behind you and you have... It does because it it does take. I would say it does take bravery to to let go of a grudge and to sort of trust that even if you personally don't put this uh, matter, you know, in balance or right this wrong, that the good things are still going to happen a, as you move forward. And and I like the uh, the second half about. Spend, don't spend your life worrying and dreading your responsibilities. The, the opposite of doing that would be, you know, happily taking on responsibility, which I know Dr. Peterson talks about a lot about and how that's the, the only way to balance out all the terrible things in life is to take on enough responsibility that your life becomes meaningful. And I think that's part of what what it's saying is that don't get bogged down by the terribleness of life and all the injustices that you're going to face because you're going to face all the injustices every day. Like you just are, there's no, there's no way around it. But what you can do is take on enough responsibility so that they're worth it because what you're doing has enough meaning. And I, I have written down, um, you know, it's a Christian idea of taking up your cross and doing it happily so that, you're happy taking on these burdens and you look at them as, I guess, opportunities for meaning rather than things that you have to do and just more injustice pile on you. And then you hold a grudge and become resentful. So. Yeah. I hadn't gone that direction with it. Uh, Actually, this was for me, this was another example of, you know, aim for the highest good, but live for the day. Oh, that's a good one too. Definitely. I see that. Yeah. Like, uh, like I, I, again, I don't think that's exactly the way that, uh, that uh, concept is, should be phrased, but it's the one that, that I remember now. So, you know, I'll go with it. But, but I, th- I think the two are, are connected though. It's like y- you have this burden to, to, to bear sort of thing, because, you know, anything that's worthwhile is going to take some effort and that's, you know, what you aim for, but, you know, live for the day. Don't worry about those, those things that are, are maybe, maybe, you know, the, the parts that, that go along with it, you know, maybe there's some hard things, but don't, don't dwell on it. Don't, uh, don't worry about it. And so maybe, you know, you take up that burden willingly, gladly, and you, you just go for it. And yeah, you know, maybe there's some discomfort or whatnot, but if you're going to come out better on the other side, which, uh, you know, I, I darn well think, uh, followers of Christianity would say that, uh, you know, the, the price of bearing that cross was, uh, was worth it. Right. So oh, for sure they would, that's, uh, that's a good one. I didn't go in that direction, but that's, that's really good. Shall we move on? Sounds good. Uh, Back to the poem. Verse 49. I gave my clothes to two scarecrows once when I walked in a field. They thought they were human as soon as they had the clothes on. A naked man feels ashamed. Okay. So this was the stanza before really digging into it that I really didn't understand too well, except for the last part about, you know, a naked man feeling ashamed. That's, that's a, an old idea, um, uh, for various reasons, you know, we, we think we're, you know, it's not good to be naked sort of thing and you feel ashamed for it. So, okay, that's nice. That's there. That's nice. Um, but so there's some good notes in, uh, Car- Caroline Larrington's translation of the poetic had another translation we use just 
supplementary for the most part, just to, you know, have a different perspective on it. But in her notes, she, she mentions that the scarecrows, scarecrow is one translation, but it could just be referring to wooden beings, which could be considered to be idols or, um, you, you know, aspects of, of worship, you know, some, some sort of element that could be worshiped. So, okay. Taking it along that line, if this is, if these are, you know, uh, idols or, or, uh, religious icons, uh, objects of religious significance, what are objects of religious significance? They are things that are considered to be more sacred than the mundane world around it which I think in today's world, you know, the way that we live, those are the things that matter the most. Those are the things that deserve attention. And those are the things that deserve um, putting time and effort into making sure that they are uh, cared for and nourished and encouraged. And then good things will come. The implication is that good things will come by giving an offering literally or figuratively to those things that matter most. And so maybe on a practical level here, the way the example turns itself is that, you know, here are these idols that don't have clothes on and maybe it's actually just a good thing for them to have clothes on because maybe Odin thinks, well, I don't like to be naked. I don't think these, uh, these religious statues or something like that are particularly happy being naked. So here I'll give them some clothes and, you know, he talks all about being prepared, having clothing, right? He's giving something up. He's giving something up to these, you know, for all intents and purposes, inanimate objects, if you want to take it literally. But what he's doing really is he's making an offering to these things that matter the most, to these things that represent those things that matter the most. And the whole idea of sacrifice the whole idea of how that developed is that was a way for humanity to enunciate the idea that it's better to sacrifice the present for the future. It's better to make those sacrifices for those things that are going to have a long-term effect. And the, but but they they had to do that for a long time by actually living out that sacrifice in a practical manner, whether it was to remind people that this is how you should be living or whether it was something like, you know, but they actually, well, I'm sure it is the case that they, they, that they believed that the literal sacrifices were necessary and literally giving something up as an offering was necessary because maybe that puts you into some kind of a mindset that, you know, if you are constantly going to sacrifice the things that you have, for some greater purpose, for something that's going to pay off in the future, that it's it's going to work out. And so if the idea was that you made an offering to um, to some kind of religious statue or religious idol or something like that, that puts you in the mindset of, okay, I've got a sacrifice and it's going to come out better for me in the end. You know what? That's a good result. And maybe we, we look at that and say, okay, here's some kind of a superstition here. But uh, no, to, to me, this is like, this is how we as society discovered that it was better to save for the future and to make sacrifices, you know, animals, all kinds of animals, you know, uh, wolves will eat, you know, 20, 40 pounds of meat in one go because they have no idea when, when the next meal is going to happen. But, you know, we don't do that. We don't eat all the food in the fridge because we don't know if there's going to be more food in the fridge. We know that we're going to eventually get more food because that's part of being human. So I think that reading of this particular stanza is meaningful and impactful and references a core part of society and how we figured out the way of being in the world that results in us moving forward as humanity and building on the the sacrifices of our ancestors. Awesome. I actually, I went in a, in a probably a different, uh, like probably completely different direction. Not, and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't contradict anything you've said, but I like that, uh, take it's very interesting. And when I did read, um, Larrington's translation, because <clears throat> when I read this verse, I was, I was kind of like, okay, scarecrows with clothes on. That's kind of weird, but uh, so yeah, I saw that and it, it's, uh, I like your take on it a lot. I, I kept with the idea of, uh, scarecrows and 
looked at it maybe maybe from a more uh, literal sense with the clothing because <clears throat> as we know humans are the only well, I'm going to say as humans are the only creatures that wear wear clothing I'm pretty sure that's right I don't think I don't think chimps do or anything that would resemble clothing I don't think so no unless we like, we like dress them up kind of thing which has ha- like I've seen pictures of that but I don't if someone knows of like a, a chimp practice of wearing like hats made out of leaves or something come out of the rain, like definitely let us know because that'd be kind of cool. But as far as I know, humans are the only animals that, that wear clothing. And the reason for that is that we're so uh, fragile and vulnerable. And part of that is because we walk upright and, you know, all of our uh, soft and vulnerable bits are like presented to the world. So, and not just like the obvious one is like, you know, genitals. Yes. It's on, you know, if we're naked, they'd be presented to the world, but also like the parts that if you hit, will it'll kill us like our throats and our bellies and that kind of thing. Like, so we're, we're very vulnerable creatures. And the idea is that, you know, we, we wear clothes to one protect ourselves from from the elements and have some, at least some sort of barrier between us and things that can harm us. But also, it's you don't want to have that level of vulnerability in front of strangers all the time. And it, you know, you, it's it's nerve wracking enough making sure you're wearing the right clothes to look good and whatever. But Imagine being naked and having people look at you naked all the time and sort of wondering, trying to find your place in the dominance hierarchy at that level of examination to everyone. I, I don't think anyone wants that, that in their life. That's way too stressful. So that's one of the reasons why we wear clothes and why you would feel ashamed not wearing it because you're, you're so open and vulnerable and you'd be constantly reminded of your sort of wretched vulnerableness, vulnerability to the world. And you you just don't need that in your life. That's a level of stress that that's one of the things society does, right? It takes care of those levels of stress that you'd constantly have to be uh, worrying about. So I I think uh, what I got from it was that uh, clothing in particular, but sort of knowing how to be in society and acting acting properly in society is what makes people human. And so when you, I think it's kind of, kind of funny or kind of a a joke where that's like, so I, you know, I dressed up two scarecrows and they they thought they were people. And I think there's like even kids shows about that where I remember watching one where you put a magic hat on a mannequin or even like Frosty the snowman, you put, you, you gave them human items and they came to life and acted like humans. So so yeah, that, that's where uh, that's where I went with uh, with this verse. No, I really like that point. You know, that, that's the the way you are a human is by uh, your person is by actively engaging in those social norms, something like that. Yeah, that's that's a that's a good one. And 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 I like that you mentioned that society kind of takes care of these things for you by having these social norms, because the next place I took this to was that you know. Maybe literally it could be referring to, you know, whether it's scarecrows or maybe it's referring to some kind of religious idol or something like that. What are the things that matter the most? Well, okay, everyone's going to have a different answer for that. But I think if if we're going to distill that, it's going to be people. It's going to be you care for the people that matter the most, you you know, uh, you, you care for. If you, if you at least accept that there is some basic level of humanity in every person, you know, everyone deserves to, you know, be cared for and, uh, and to be a part of society sort of thing. So to me, what this actually is, and this is going to relate back to, you know, us being, you know, these, uh, these really brutal, you know, people on welfare need to just pull themselves up by their bootstraps. That's not what we were saying. Be precise in your speech. I think this stanza is what 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 brings in that that flip side to it. You know, you don't want to be the type of person that is um, reliant on charity, sort of thing. But then it it's a call to action to say, care for people who have nothing. If you see somebody around there who's 
just naked. They've got nothing or, or are these days it would probably be homeless would be the, uh, the best analogy here. It's like actually give them something to give them at least that basic level of, of social dignity so they can. So this is not saying he's going to give the scarecrow clothes, food, a house, a job, any of that. He's giving them clothes. He's giving them just the basics. He's not going all the way to say, okay, here's your life. Here's, here's everything that you need to, to be successful now, but here's some clothes. Here is the basics. Basics are taken care of for you now. I've got more than enough of, I've got, I've got more than two pairs of clothes or three pairs of clothes or something like that. Here, have some. Now you can maybe become a person, start to engage in society and actually build yourself out of it. So it's the two-sided thing, 100%. The way I take this is 100%. We need charity. We need people to give to charities that help impact the less fortunate. We even need the government, which is really just the society that has become bureaucratized and and brought up in, in sort of a sense that, you know, there's this common framework that we all rely on and not rely. That's the, that is not the word I was going for. Uh, this common framework that we all agree on that we, that we, uh, that we have kind of sharing, um, that we all put something into, you know, but, uh, you know, maybe there is that sort of rule, right. That society is going to take care of those people who are most vulnerable and, uh, and need a helping hand at rock bottom sort of thing. So for sure. And actually, I, I hadn't actually thought of, um, I hadn't gone that far in my thinking with this first, but I, I absolutely agree with that. That it, that it is a call that for charity, because when, when someone doesn't have the, the basic needs, they definitely, and see people who do have them, they definitely, definitely feel like less than human. And so making sure that everyone has these, uh, these basic needs, they at least get to be human again. Right. And we're, we were talking earlier, um, about how it's harmful to the soul for someone to not have these things or harmful. I think that in the Havamal, they say it hurts your heart to beg for every meal. Well, you know, they say it right here, a naked man feels ashamed. Well, it's the exact same idea that if they don't have enough of the basic things that you need to live as a human with dignity, then you're, you are going to feel ashamed. And it is incumbent on the society to, I guess, limit the amount of people who are, who are feeling ashamed in that way as much as possible, because that's like one of the, the quickest ways to unravel society is to have people with nothing living next to people with lots. And that, that discrepancy in wealth in that close proximity is sort of the key to, is, is the key to like civil unrest that's that's a big reason for the the french revolution like when you had you had a lot of poor people seeing how uh the elites were living and and i mean the elites had no idea how the the poor were living there you know oh they don't have bread well why don't they just eat cake well yeah it's, it's that idea of having that close proximity of you you can't have that that discrepancy in a, in that close proximity because it, uh, it builds resentment far too quickly and then it unravels society. Exactly. I do believe that quote is apocryphal, right? That Marie Antoinette thing. It's, it's not necessarily exactly what she said no. or directly yeah. attributed to her or something like that, but it was a common enough, uh, distillation of the idea that the elites in general were, yes. were, uh, had that, had that mindset and feeling, right? So I know, I know exactly. It's, it's a, it's a great point. To, it's funny. Uh, the, the verses that I have the most trouble understanding to begin with eventually turn into some of the, the, the most deep and the most meaningful after sure. exploring it for a long time. So I enjoyed this one. Yeah, it's a good one. All right. Uh, moving on to verse 50, back to the poem, a fir tree decays standing over a farm no longer protected by bark and needles. A person is the same way. If nobody loves him, how will he live much longer? So I think this is really a continuation of the previous thread, to be honest. 
And, and again, Larrington has some great notes on this. The the implication is that uh, people stripped the the leaves and the bark of you know this fir tree that's mentioned here for some practical purpose, right? And so, I mean, if you take that into you, if you take that as the metaphor that it is, right? I think that means something to the effect of you you know society or people have maybe taken everything from a person that I, I think it, I think it acknowledges that victimization does exist in the world and that it is a, a negative thing. It's something that shouldn't necessarily, well, not necessarily as something that shouldn't, shouldn't happen because what the result is, you know, is it leaves somebody broken with, with, no protection and nobody loves him. You, you know, that's, that's, I think very directly sort of pointing to that, uh, you, you know, you, as society in general, we shouldn't be out to strip vulnerable people, vulnerable people of everything that they have, because it's just going to lead to death and depression and suffering, you know, avoid unnecessary suffering. I mean, that's, that's just an idea here. Right. So, and it, and it it uh, underscores the the need for human companionship too. So it's on a lot of levels. It's it's a it's a kind of heavy one. It's a it's a it's a sad image, right? But uh, something you have to something you have to face and encounter and recognize that there there is these negative parts of uh, of society and people that are struggling and and suffering and maybe they maybe they have some some reason to feel like they are victimized. Maybe they are actually victimized and, and it's, uh, I think it, it, it continues the call to action that, that that has to be dealt with in some sort of positive manner. So. Definitely. I, I took a, a similar vein, but looked at it from a, a slightly different perspective because I looked at it as, a the dangers of not having in, you know, I guess in the Norse case, the tribe, but society to have around, like not having the tribe or society around you to protect you. Uh, again, looking at it as, uh, you know, humans are communal animals and in a, in a very practical way that, you know, individuals, especially back then, they didn't, they weren't going to survive long without having a tribe around them. You can't, you can't fight off that amount of chaos alone. And there was actually a, like a great fear around not having, having your tribe or your people around you to sort of uh, have that buffer zone around chaos. And you can tell this by one of the, the greatest punishments was uh, being declared an outlaw. And which meant that you were, you were kicked out of the community to the degree that it wasn't that people could kill you because you're an outlaw, which they could, but it's that they should kill you when they saw you. So you were, you were cast out of the community and so you're on your own against nature. And, and I mean, they, they even ask in this, in this, uh, stanza, how will he live much longer? Well, he isn't on, on your own. You're not going to survive very long. That that's the, that's just the, the reality of being human. There's too, we're up against too much to be able to survive, survive on our own. And I, I like what you're saying about the stanzas as a call to action that there are, again, there, there are people in society that are closer to living alone than a lot of people. And if, if, how are they going to survive that if, if we don't uh, take care of that? So yeah, it's a, it's a powerful, these two stanzas have been very powerful in their in their call to to protect the individuals of of society that aren't doing as well for myriad of reasons, uh, but they do link it to the idea that it's actually good for society as a whole to make sure there there aren't a lot of people at the very bottom rung who have nothing. Yeah, definitely, we're hitting two really good sides of this, uh, of this particular stanza. And, and I mean, I think, I think they dovetail together. I mean, there, there's something to the idea of, you know, people who are essentially living on the outside of society. You know, I think that's what being alone really means. You, you know, maybe they, they live physically inside society, but they are kind of on the outside looking in. And I mean, 
I think it gets to maybe some possible causes of that that uh, context and then and then you hint at you know maybe they've done it to themselves and get themselves kicked out but both in both cases the result is the same right and the result is you know it's 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 someone who's not really going to be able to to live much longer without the benefit of society being there for them kind of having their back and i mean i i think it does underscore the importance of having a clearly defined society where you where you know what the norms are and you know what the uh, what the expectations are, and, and I mean, uh, w- without that, w- without having uh, you know some clearly defined um, places to live, states, uh, nations, however you want to, whatever term you want to use, w- without that, you know, I I think everyone is going to end up being lost without that, right? So I think that underscores the importance there. Definitely, I actually hadn't, hadn't thought about, about that, but. Yeah, without the clearly the clearly defined societies, it becomes harder for the society to protect its members from the chaos that's pressing in against from all sides, as it always is. So, no, that's a that's a good point. So, uh, moving on back to the poem, verse fifty one. The friendship among false friends burns warmly for five days, and. But then it's extinguished by the sixth day and the friendship is over. Yeah, I think this one is, is pretty straightforward, to be honest. It's it's something like people who aren't truly your friends aren't going to be there for you in the long term. Or it, well, maybe even more literally, like maybe you, you get along with somebody in, in the really short term, but then you realize, you know, maybe you're not that great for each other and you, you just stop being friends after a little while sort of thing. Like it, it's, I don't read too much into this. Like it, it's, I think it's, you know, it's, it's using a metaphor, but I think it's, it's pretty straightforwardly saying, you know, it's, it's, uh, false friendships are, are not necessarily going to, to last long. And they're certainly not going to be there for you in the long term. But no, I, for sure. I looked at it too. And I saw that- this idea of uh, novelty where you, you meet someone who you think is really awesome and you know, it's, you're having a great time for the first few days, but then as, as who they are starts to come out, you realize, well, wait a second, they're actually not good for me. So I'm not going to, uh, see so the friendship sort of, uh, fizzles out. You see this happen in, uh, I'd say romantic relationships even more because there's that sort of hormone soup of meeting someone new and it's all fun and exciting. And, You've got the rose-colored glasses on, and then it it ta- I think it takes like anywhere from three to six months for the, all those hormones to calm down before you can actually like look at the other person for who they are, and uh, and then if it's if it's a false relationship, it it'll fall apart sort of within that time frame. Uh, but if there's something there, then it just keeps going. Yeah, I like that. I think novelty was the word I was looking for. Yes, so. awesome. Should we move on? Yeah, I think so. Sounds good. Uh, Back to the poem, verse 52. You should not give only big gifts. Often a little thing will win you favor. I have won friends with just half a loaf of bread and a bowl of soup. So first of all, another one that I think is somewhat straightforward. It's the small things that keep a friendship going. The little things, right? it's, It's not big grand gestures all the time. It's just you know, those things that, uh, y- you know, th- that little bit of reciprocity with people, you know, you just, maybe this is an example of kind of like the, the, the things that you don't have to worry about. Like, these are the things that you don't really need payment or repayment for because it's just like, yeah, we're friends. I'm going to, I'm going to buy your coffee or something like that because why not? You'll get me next time sort of thing. Like, to me, that's what this is really talking about it's the things like it's things like this that keep a friendship going and then maybe i'll contrast that with the the previous stanza sort of thing it's like that's not going to be taking place in a false friendship so so to speak right so yeah it's i i I don't i don't see tons in this it's but uh like well and that's not that's not a negative i think it's it's just talking about a an idea that is really fundamental to friendship and that's a good thing for sure yeah, I see it's it's the normal day-to-day stuff that 
you do for and with your friends that build up the friendship, not necessarily these, you know, big grand gestures. And I don't think that they mention uh, food by accident because eating is something that we all ha have in common and sharing food is super basic and eating together. It, it's a very basic, simple way of creating and maintaining relationships. Think of, think of fa like family dinner where you sit with your family, the people that you're closest to and just talk about your day or whatever. Like that's, that that's how human beings act and how they build strong bonds. So no, it's uh it's very straightforward, but I guess it doesn't take away any of its power or meaning. Agreed. You know, the, yeah, that these things that might seem obvious, whatever, I think it's still valuable that they are said, right? Oh, like, absolutely. It's things that shouldn't be taken for granted. It's, it's, it's things that, you know, you know, maybe if you take some inventory of yourself, maybe you're not keeping up with, a good friend in the way that you should, because maybe you, maybe you don't have this sort of these little things going on and maybe that, well, maybe that's one, like a, uh, something to indicate that maybe that's not that great of a friendship or it's something like, Hey, maybe you should go ahead and call your friend and say, Hey, can, can I buy you some dinner? Because we haven't talked in ages. And yeah. it's, uh, it, it, even if something looks straightforward and obvious to me, I, I think it, you have to take it to that next level where you're like, okay, how does this impact my life? And, and, and what does that imply? And yeah, on, on this one, I think it, it's sort of, well, to me, to me, it really emphasizes, you know, the, the, the good and positive relationships that I have because these things take place. So definitely. All right. So we'll move on to verse uh, 53 where the beaches are small. It's a small sea that washes them. And so it is with little minds. Not everyone is equally wise, but the average is moderately wise. So I really like this one. I really like it a lot. First of all, the metaphor is fantastic. Okay, let's, let's break this down a little bit. So he's talking about es essentially little minds. He's talking about essentially intelligence and wisdom and the capability of people to have that intelligence and wisdom. And, and you know, it, he, it, this is implying that people are not of equal ability when it comes to intelligence or wisdom or, or whatnot here, but I love the metaphor. So, okay. The sea and the water here, we've, we've talked about this before in previous episodes. It's a symbol of pre-cosmogonic chaos First of all, the the ocean, the the water. That's a that's a symbol of the chaos that is there at the beginning of the world that has the potential to become everything, and also the potential to destroy. It's what the 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 world sinks down into water at the end of the world in Ragnarok, which is uh, you know if you haven't listened to that episode, uh, that's episode three, uh, the Volus put part three. We go into that in a lot greater detail. But it's also, so so the, the side of this that I want to focus on here, though, is that it's the potential or the inspiration. So, okay, let's open this up a little bit. The name Odin comes from uh, an older variation of the term is Woden, which is related to Wod, which is this concept of inspiration. And the idea is that Odin is essentially the personification and embodiment of inspiration. And he's certainly, he's got features to his personality that are not just based on that. But to me, it's the idea that inspiration is the source of wanting to search for knowledge and wanting to take this, this chaos, this unknown and make something out of it, take something out of it. That's to me what inspiration is. So bearing that in mind, a small beach is going to be washed by a small sea. It's only going to get a very little bit of inspiration. And so to me, this is really using a metaphor in a really unique and interesting way to sort of say that, you know, maybe some people are not necessarily going to be able to get these great ideas or this inspiration or this wisdom the same way because this is, they're actually capacity limited. They are a small beach and they're going to get a small amount of 
the sea washing over them to give them inspiration as a result. And really this just bottom line speaks to the fact that there are the fact that there are differences in ability, IQ, intelligence quotient being really the the best um, example of that quantifier of that uh, as, as far as anyway, intelligence goes. And it really just shows that there was an understanding that are, that there are, actual innate differences in ability for people that cannot be changed. So for sure. Um, and building off that, which I thought was a great, I hadn't thought of that for the, um, for the relationship to inspiration and Odin. So that was, that was awesome. It, um, I look at it too, just building off that it, with uh, creativity, like not everyone is as creative as the next person. And especially with inspiration, like you'd see some people have a, a little bit or, well, no, just some people just don't, I mean, they, they aren't as creative as the next person. I mean, I'm, I look at some artists and I'm like, how did you even come up with that? Like, it's just, and I especially love that too, because when you see, I think it's amazing to see people do things that you could, you can't do or, you, and you could never do in a, in a million years and just having your, your mind expanded by that because you're like, wow, this is, this is something that's possible that, you know, on my own, I would never would have imagined. So that's one of, for me, one of the best feelings in the world. So it's a, it's a great little verse just about the, the variety of skill sets in life and that, um, you know, on average, everyone has a little bit of something, but some people have been blessed with, you know, a great capacity for wisdom or creativity or physical prowess, things like that. So, yeah. No, that, that's a great point. First of all, like the, the idea, if you can recognize that some people are gifted, you know, wh whether we want to refer to that as, you know, their, their biological potential or something like that, sure. or, or, you, you know, through hard work, someone has, has overcome maybe their, uh, their deficiencies, but done something great with it. You can appreciate that because, you know, if we all say, well, okay, everyone is going to get a trophy just for participating sort of thing, it devalues the the people that do well in this particular game. And I think some, some of the reasoning is so that no one feels bad that they don't do as well as other people, right? The answer is pick a different game. Find the game that you're good at. Find the game where maybe you are a big beach and you can get washed over with loads of inspiration and, and you can do something great. And not everyone is going to have that. I, I completely understand that there, there are some people that, that did, well, there are some people that the U.S. military will refuse to let in because you have to have a, a base level of IQ in order, in order to get in. I think it, it's, it's either 83 or 85 or something like that, that they say that's your minimum level. Like, and the army will take anyone. So if they're saying like, yeah, we, we actually can't do anything for you if, if you don't meet this minimum standard, that's significant. And I mean, it's a harsh reality. It's a harsh reality that has huge, compl uh, huge implications for what we as society have to do. I believe it's something like 15% of the population is below that threshold, right? And that's, that's a significant group of people. And the flip side is that they're the top 15% of people for IQ or for, or for talent or ability in, in any field because IQ obviously only measures, um, you know, mental, um, acuity, right. But you, you know, it, and it, and it certainly doesn't measure specific skills or talents, right. But those people at the high end there are, are going to be doing something great. And so I think this is on the one hand, something that sort of says, okay, so we are going to recognize that, that some people, unfortunately don't have exactly the same, uh, uh, aren't playing with the same uh, set of tools sort of thing. Right. But, but on the other hand, you, you know, maybe you can actually go and find the thing that you're good at and create something great. So for sure. Cause it, it in the verse, it doesn't say small beaches are bad. It just says that there are small beaches. And so it's not a, it's not a comment on someone's worth. If you know, they're less skilled in some, in some way. Like I know like my beach for cooking is almost non-existent and I hope, and I hope that doesn't mean I'm a bad person because of it. Um, but it, it just, I, I, it's just a recognition that, 
people have different talents. And I think that we would be wise to recognize those talents and then let people flourish in those talents and not, not try and make sure, make everyone the same, I think is, well, I'm not sure it's saying that specifically in here, but that's sort of the, if you look at it in a, if you expand it out, that's sort of the meaning is that there, there is a role for everyone and everyone, everyone has their thing that they're good at and they should be doing the thing that they're good at because, well, for a variety of reasons, but. Yeah, that, that's that's why I expand. That's how I expand this out to today's context as well. Is, sure. is just like it, it might not be directly in there, but taking it to its conclusion for today, right? I think that is the underlying message of, you know, like there there are differences between people, but those differences are, you know, a good thing and to be encouraged and uh, you know don't uh, um, don't flatten everything out because no, that's exactly. just going to lead to something bad. So. I think that that's how it's relevant for today. For sure. All right. So uh, moving on, we've got the last three verses that actually uh, go well together. So I'll be reading them uh, one after another, starting uh, with 54. You should be only a little wise, never too wise. The happiest people throughout their lives are the moderately wise. You should be only a little wise, never too wise. A wise man's heart is seldom glad, if he's truly wise. You should only be, you should be only a little wise, never too wise. It's best not to know your fate beforehand. You'll live happier if you don't. Okay. Kind of a bummer. Well... So Bering, first of all, stands a 53 in mind on this as well. And who's talking? Odin is saying this. Odin is saying that you should only be moderately wise, only a little wise, never too wise. He's the one who's going for all the wisdom. He's the one going for all the wisdom, all the knowledge, all of the everything. He is the one who is sacrificing and striving to to know every little detail and be as wise as possible. And he is saying, that's not the best way to be. So first of all, that self-awareness, I think, is 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 very, very telling. Something to do with the the burden of responsibilities and and the unhappiness at, at extreme. So I mean the the unhappiness at the the far low end is obvious, right? That's like you know you're poor, you're the you're the low lobster, you're you're not gonna do all that great in life. Life is gonna be bad for you. But then at the full other end, you're you're also isolated. You know you've you've got this this knowledge or this talent or this skill that that just drives and drives and drives at you and maybe you can create something great but uh i'm sure we know of maybe maybe one example could be musicians who just drink themselves to death literally right like something like that people with great talents and and abilities and things like that but but still have a tough time You, you know uh um who am I thinking of? Um, the 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 Lincoln Park guy as, oh, as a uh, Chester example. Chester Bennington. Yeah, like I mean that that's like you know someone who who had something really going for them, but uh, y- you know still have issues with depression and and life sure. not, not being as great sort of thing. But and then the last line here, you know, it's best to not know your fate beforehand. You'll live happier if you don't. That is so far, we've already seen a common thread for something that Odin is already looking for. He wants to know his fate. He wants to know the fate of those around him. But the burden is that now that he does know or or implying that he does know at some point is that he has to, first of all, do everything he has to to fulfill it, which is hard, which is difficult. He has to sacrifice significantly for that. And he knows things are going to end badly. Who wants to live with that knowledge? I mean, I think we all understand on some level that we're going to die one day, but if you're thinking about that all the time, if you if you want to be like, well, I want to know exactly when I'm going to die and how it's going to happen, I don't see how you can live with that and not fixate on it and not have that oh, be like, sure. whether it's something like, I'm going to die, I'm I'm scared, I'm I'm just not going to function anymore, or, or the flip side, like how am I going to make my life meaningful in the time that I have left sort of thing. So it's... Yeah, it, it, I love this set of three here, and it's it's uh, it's telling that really the 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 message here is something like 
it's good to live a normal life and it's good to be moderately skilled and, and be able to give something useful to society, but also to be able to enjoy it and live happily and following the path that Odin sets for us as an example is hard. It's hard to live your life perpetually sacrificing, perpetually uh, perpetually having your eye on, on your fate and on your future and really taking that responsibility and living with it and doing something with it. Having that as the path that you choose to take is, is hard. It's, it's difficult and it's going to be, it's going to have an impact on your happiness and your, your life. And the two sides to that, I think are, are incredibly powerful. And it's, uh, as much as, as it is just something that says, you know, it's, it's good to be normal and have a, a normal life. It's, it's also a warning to, you know, this is the, the path of Odin to me is one of the, the best ways you can live to constantly sacrifice so that you, you get something greater in the future, but it's also hard and it's a warning not to take that path up unless you're serious. Definitely. It. Well, for the first thing that comes to my mind, especially because it's Odin saying this, who has the wisdom, is just again how how hard it would be for him to one know like he knew about Balder, about his son who is going to have to die, and as well, uh, Frigg also is said to know the the fates of every living being. So she she would also have an intense amount of wisdom, and that would she knew her beloved son was going to die as well. And she did everything she could to prevent it. So th there is a lot of, there is a lot of pain in that, in having that wisdom and knowledge. And it, it makes you, I think a lot of what they're talking about is sort of being self-conscious in that, you know, you know how you're vulnerable, you know, of the evil in the world of the evil in yourself. You have, you have all of these ideas and you have all this knowledge of how hard it is. And so you have to, and so you go, you go into it with your eyes open, but at the same time your eyes are open, you can see it like it doesn't make it less horrible. It's just now you know why it's happening. And, uh, it, uh, I, I can really see the, the, the value of the, of this, uh, advice, especially in this day and age where we can get, uh, our news from around the world, right at our fingertips. And a lot of the times there's nothing that we can do about things that are, that are far away from us. And they actually don't impact our lives in a, in a real way, other than we've heard about this and it's terrible. And now we're, we're feeling appropriately bad for it. So this isn't like, I'm not saying like, don't read the news or anything, but there is that there are a lot of things in life that you just have zero control over. And a lot, a lot of times it's because it's happening so far away from your physical location. And so if you, if you read about some tragedy, you know, on the other side of the world, there isn't really much you can do. Like you can donate some money, but again, really that isn't that much. And it's certainly not going to, uh, help with those feelings of, of pain and the mourning that you're going to feel, you know, sort of in solidarity with the people. So it having that, there is a price you paid for being able to, to know and see all of these things that, you know, it, it's hard and you are seldom glad. Wow. I, I hadn't gone in that direction with it. That's, that's heavy. Yeah. It's, it's a heavy, like few verses. It's a bummer. It, it, as much as it is a bummer yeah. though, I do want to, I do want to say, and, and maybe this is, this is my closing thought. Uh, you might have one too, but this is what I want to end on is, is, uh, is something like it's still worth it to know it's still worth it to make those sacrifices. And we aren't necessarily going to see in this episode or, or even in the, some of the others that we've covered so far, but we, we are going to see in, in, in future episodes that this is that sacrifice and 
obtaining knowledge and living your life in a way that's meant to build yourself up, it is a good way to live. Definitely. It's worth it, but it's hard. And so this is, I think, something that's sort of giving uh, an easy out. And I don't, I don't, I don't even want to say that negatively. This is like, yeah, you can live your life just in in a in a normal way. Be happy. That's great. You you know maybe maybe you apply your skills in some in some good way that's that's worthwhile to you and worthwhile to society, and that's fantastic. But if you decide to take up this path, to take up this cross, this burden, and go for the path of sacrifice, of discipline, of building something greater than yourself that you want to last longer than you'll even be alive, that's going to be hard. And you need to know that. I I do want to say that I believe it is worthwhile to take that up. It's very worthwhile. The, The rewards, you know, may not be immediate, but that's the point. That's the entire point. And you, you know, the, the flip side to it, you know, if, if you live your life moderately wise and you're just happy, it's fantastic that this says there's nothing wrong with that because I don't think people should be shamed for not necessarily fulfilling their potential because I mean, that's, that's an intangible thing that, uh, that gets uh, that gets thrown thrown around, you know. Maybe someone just goes and decides to run a surf shop in Hawaii or something like that, but they're happy, right? And maybe they had some potential, according to some people, and they squandered it. But who cares if they're if they're living their life in a good way that's contributing to society in some way? A surf shop, I don't know, but yeah, maybe. But uh, but living this path is is perfectly fine if you live it that way, but. But then if you take it to that next level and follow really what I consider to be the path of Odin, which again, we'll get into in a, in a lot greater detail in future episodes, it's hard, but it's it's worth it. So having this warning is a good thing, but I, I do want to say that I believe it's it's worth it to sacrifice and worth it to try and have that discipline and, and build something for the future. I would agree. And I, I think the way even... Odin would uh, look at this as as being worth having wisdom is that, you know, this is the saying, this is the high one. So we'll, you know, we're saying it's written by Odin. Well, that's what, that's what the mythology around it is. Well, he doesn't stop the verses after he says, you know, don't be too wise. There's a, a lot of verses that come after it. So even he is saying that, you know, it's worth finding out more like, having your eyes opened. It's just painful. Very, yeah, it's just painful. It's just very painful, but go in with your eyes open. Absolutely. With that, I don't have any, anything more to add. No, and I think that's a good spot to leave it for uh, the next time we uh, look at the Havamal. Sounds good to me. Sounds good. So we've covered our closing remarks again, I guess some thank yous. So one, once again, uh, thank you to uh, Jackson Crawford and Hackett Publishing for uh, his translations you can find it uh, a link to it on amazon uh, in our description in our bio as well uh, a link to his uh, youtube channel which is uh, chock full of uh, norse mythology goodness and then uh, again we'd be remiss if we don't thank uh, dr jordan peterson who we've did his, he did his uh, biblical lectures and we thought well let's we could uh look at norse mythology in a similar way and you can oh we do have our uh social media up now so uh facebook uh northern myths podcast uh instagram northern myths podcast uh twitter at at northern myth at northern myths at northern myths and facebook is the same uh, slash northern myths yeah. and then we're both on twitter uh at North Myth Luke and at North Myth Dan. With an S. No, myths. Oh, Myths, yeah. yeah. I think I couldn't. Right. No, I think you're right, yeah. I couldn't remember what was too long for it, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Northern Myths Luke or Northern Myths Dan was too long. Gotcha. And uh, I think that about covers it again. Uh, thank you, Simon, for your input on that verse. Uh, we'll be doing that uh, again where we put out a verse that's tricky and getting input from it. And... Uh, 
Yeah, so so please get onto the social yeah. media with us. We'd love to connect with you and uh, yeah, uh, keep an eye out for uh, for us asking that uh, that question and and get involved. Uh, comment, please subscribe and share. It's it's great to know that people are uh, are listening to this. Uh, you, you know, I think at the time of recording this episode, we've got something like seven hundred downloads of the podcast, which is just mind blowing. It's that's basically seven hundred more downloads than I thought we'd get. So for sure, uh, it's it's just great to know that people are are listening and watching so please subscribe you know if, if you're if you're using the podcast uh, please leave a review on your uh, on your pref- preferred channel and uh, you know if you're on youtube you know uh, subscribe to our channel uh, give us a like give us a comment we'd really appreciate it and and please do share if you uh, if you know people that uh, might also uh, like this uh, particular podcast because again I mean it's we, we did this for us definitely we did this for us to to know more about this stuff but it's uh, it means a lot to know that there's uh, there's some people out there who are listening and watching and maybe getting something out of it and uh, love to connect with you yeah for sure and and uh when you comment stuff like let us know like what you like what you don't like uh things we're we've gotten wrong uh you know if anyone knows about chimps wearing hats definitely and uh yeah like and talk about the stories you want to hear about because you know we we love this stuff so we're happy to talk with anyone who loves it too exactly we we've got a lot to cover in the in the coming uh you know weeks months years but uh you know we hope to to cover things that people want to want to learn about Yeah. And so I think with that, uh, we'd like to say here when we're signing off, um, a paraphrase of uh, Carl Jung to uh, know the myth that you're living. With that, from uh, Northern Myths Podcast, uh, have a good one.